What's going on, everybody? It is I, Free Brewski Manana, <laughs> and I am joined today by none other than Big Signorelli himself, yeah. Siggy Stardust, <laughs> Siggy Pop, <laughs> Sigor. Dirk Sigler. <laughs> Dirk Sigler. I love that. That's a good one. Dallas joke. Master Signifier right there. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Schoolboy Leclerc. Master Big Signified P. Yep. The Sultan of the memes. Sultan of all significations for any possibility of memes. The Polygamina to any future memes. <laughs> the name of the father precedes him. Yeah. <laughs> Master Signified Bodies. How's it going? It's going well. Just got this new mic right here that uh free beer tomorrow gave me. So now we could be a part of the, the club. <laughs> free beer tomorrow is merely the cluster of signifiers with which he is associated. So we can thank that pullulating swarming hive yeah. of significations for the lovely audio that you're hearing today. So the next time we interview a big name like Todd McGowan, I don't want to hear any complaints about the quality of the audio. Yeah. That's on you. Yeah. <laughs> what you can't hear is what you fill in with your own fantasy and right. those are always the best ideas so the truth lies in the gaps exactly no, that's perfect so what are we going over today today we are going to be talking about the circuit that's right circuit city yes taking us back to The circuit. When last we left our hero, what was he talking about? He was talking about um, we well, the last one we were talking about was the compulsion to repeat and um, the machine with Freud and Hegel. Right. And Freud, Hegel, the machine. There is more in there's more of man in the machine than man himself. He says something exactly, yeah. like that. So today we're going to be continuing with this notion of the machine. And now that Lacan has made some strides in, let's say, defining what a machine is to his mind, we are going to understand or we're going to be led to hopefully understand, get a taste of what the message that enters that machine is, how it circulates within the machine, and what is a message? What is repetition? Yeah. How does a message reach its destination? We're not quite at the purloined letter yet, yeah. but some foreshadowing of those exactly. themes yeah. is yeah. definitely present here. Lacan begins by not so subtly sticking a, a pen into the backside of our good friend Merlo Ponty. I know I, that uh, Master Signified here is a, a big Merlo Ponty fan. He definitely knows plenty more than I do about this thinker, and he'll be able to hopefully relate some of. Uh, Ponty's central ideas to the argument we are about to embark upon understanding. What say you, Master Sig? So it seems like, you know, as you said, like he stabs, he, he puts a pin in his back pretty much. It's like, it's Ice Cube and Easy E, no Vaseline disc. This is exactly what Lacan does right here <laughs> for, for my boy Merlu Ponty. But the, the issue is, is that like Merlu Ponty gave a, a lecture 
the night before on a essay. I don't think it was ever published. And I think Brian Becker says the same thing in his video that he gives on there too. Shout out to the homie BB. Um, that uh, the essay Psychoanalysis and Philosophy uh, or Philosophy and Psychoanalysis as it's entitled. Um, he makes a bold claim pretty much that like um, both philosophy as in phenomenology and um, psychoanalysis both reveal something that leads toward a better understanding of humanism, which is something that comes into question. Is Freudianism or psychoanalysis a humanism? As we even asked in, I believe, the chapter uh, that we recently went over, right? And what, what is humanism? So we have got a history of humanisms, right? We have the humanism of like, let's say early enlightenment philosophy, right? Of understanding human nature from like Hume um, and liberal humanism of like, let's say, endow with reason, uh, not to mention Renaissance humanism as kind of like being liberated by the liberal arts um, from being able to be rational and also kind of mirror, again, the image of God, because Adam, right, is the image of God. So to be liberated by these, uh, by arithmetic, by reason, by philosophy, and the other arts and sciences makes one freer, right, and not, uh, makes one more soft. And this is a kind of a, a token from uh, Dave because he's really uh, big on understanding the history of humanism, but one more soft and gentle rather than brute and savage, like, you know, the peasants or just somebody who's not educated. Shout and then out to the theory plebe. Right, yeah, theory underground, theory plebe are hysteric in the four discourses. Uh, well so with humanism, with Renaissance humanism, we get a step forward, forward and scare quotes here, away right. from a sort of dark ages conception of man as eternally downtrodden and ultimately the dross of the divine, let's say. Yeah. And through maybe we could say even some a figure like petrarch who also i would say pioneers a kind of humanism right. we return to a sense of the perfectibility of man as the ancients specifically figures like Cicero or Seneca might have imagined the individual to be able to reach this point of perfectibility exactly. where through the cultivation of certain, let's say, innate capacities, the individual is able to reach a, a height of excellence which is, let's say, in Platonic terms, and that's the, exactly incarnate, right. the, the actualization of the arete right. of the individual, as if we understand what the um, aims and, and, and goals and forms of different objects in the world are based on a kind of use value without bringing Marx into it. But the question that we explored in an earlier lecture when we were discussing the Mino is, well, what is the arate of the human, of, right. uh, of the human? Uh, and by extension, that would mean, well, what is virtue itself? Yes. Because in, in order to understand but an, an arate is a kind of virtue. In order to understand the virtue of the human being, by virtue, I don't just mean being good, making the right moral choices, virtuous behavior in the sense of like your your social your your performance uh, in in the realm of of civility, but rather 
the criteria of a thing's excellence for something to become what it is in Nietzschean terms. What is the virtue of all virtues? That's what it would mean to be human. This is my understanding of it. I'm kind of right. riffing and now, but it's sort of like this, this is a, I just want to relate this to what he calls gestaltism because I think it's very platonic. It's like you have the forms, right? you have the relation between forms, but then there is the form of all forms, which is the form of the good. Right. And the forms themselves must be informed by some larger overarching form. This is how I picture the gestalt, but I know there's also a clinical component to it, of course. Right. So, yeah, there is a, a more uh, psychological and clinical um, importance to gestaltism. And so to kind of continue on uh, like a little historical background, Merleau-Ponty is not dealing with the more Renaissance or liberal humanism. Although the charge that Lacan takes is that he ends up going towards a sort of uh, liberalism in his attempt to define humanism, because there are two types of humanisms that end up uh, arising in, in this uh, milieu of thought because of the terrors, the terrors of Stalinism um then you get from like the frankfurt school people you get this marxist humanism of going back to like Gund Risa and the economic manuscripts and german ideology right it's more for and, and uh early marx's uh man of dealing with alienation and uh you know in its relation with the species being and then you have existentialism right from sartre's understanding of of phenomenology and his misunderstanding of the project of dasein he believes that existentialism is the humanism and that we, no matter what, like, you know, uh, the whole example of like, uh, what is more right? Should the uh, Frenchman stay at home to take care of his sick mother uh, or sick grandmother, I believe it is, or uh, should he go out and avenge his brother um, during World War II to fight off the Germans who trapped him in a prison uh, and put him, made him a prisoner of war and killed him pretty much? Both are good choices. One is defending, you know, the brother's honor and also the greater good for the country. And the other one is like an obligation to his sick mother. So it's like, I think in essence, it's like this kind of dichotomy of what what's what's the ethical uh, choice or, or or being put in this like dilemma of like, is 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 it the deontology or is it the utilitarian uh, you know maxim that is more important? And that's the existentialist view is that it's really freedom is is, is self-determined by the choice that you make versus the choice that you don't and with merleau ponty i think he kind of exceeds it further by thinking that with gestaltism and uh his charges against philosophy of conceptualizing not only existence um and even you know the things themselves but also the fact of that the body has this sort of intentionality to it and you know, its spatiality and to be able to determine not only uh, its facticity, um, and he wants to get rid of this whole Sartrean dualism of being for itself and in itself, because it's sort of like different version of Cartesianism. He wants to be able to develop this notion of the good form and the gestalt by movement through space, because there's a spatiality to the body and a lived body that to have a lived body and to constantly be in this point of reference of the good form or the gestalt is to have a better totalized perception. Because he'll say later in this text that Merleau Ponty is all about totality. So for him, totality is not only freedom and self determination, but also of our embodiment of it. And again, there is this sort of liberalism that he seems to regress to in Lacan's eyes. Because of this notion of totality i like that there seems to be a kind of repressed sense of the possibility of bodily mastery there in this concept of the body and again when i think of gestalt in this sense i think of the virtue of virtues so if philosophy asks two main questions one of which is what is there or why is there something 
rather than nothing. And the other one being how do we live within this notion of gestalt? Both of those questions are somehow humanistically answered as one and the same. Right. What that something is, what is permanent, what lasts, the body, its totality, in its full realization, correct me if this is a misinterpretation of Merleau-Pontu, I don't know at all, uh, and the ethical notion of how one should live, the two are kind of bound together. A lot of philosophers, they disparately attack these questions without um, trying to introduce any kind of continuity between the answers that they give as if they would be siloed matters. I feel like with this kind of humanism, these two questions are answered in one fell swoop, but not so fast. Lacan is going to intervene yeah, to and point I think out Ponte, where this yeah. is going wrong. Does any of that make sense, or am I just? I think with Ponte, though, he's definitely uh, against, like, especially in the phenomenology of perception, he's definitely against, like, um, this uh, vulgar empiricism and uh, what he calls into intellectualism um, of, like, one, just relying so much on empirical data, um, trying to formulate an uh, independent model of reality of how it is just by sensuous data and observation, scientific uh, method, and then from this over sense of schematizing everything. And so in his phenomenology, his back, his going back to Husserl and, and Heidegger, but also like with uh, his, some indebtedness to Sartre, but also critique of Sartre and pretty much his understanding of cognitive sciences or cognitive psychology, experimental psychology playing with like perception, not as just something of like what the mind perceives or the subject, but also, you know, its ethical implications of the nature of experience and also like its facticity, but what its determination is. And it's always reliant on perception. And this is why Lacan is also thinking that like, for him, it's always going to know. It doesn't matter what is outside, you know, or or what is what is being what the object of, of perception is for. It automatically is going to circulate back to the primacy of consciousness, which is a text that uh, Mulu Ponty gave as well. Besides this one, he has another one called Primacy of Perception. And I want to allude because you mentioned something about like you know you get the sense that there is this. Uh, mastery of the body there really is and there is another essay or, or collections of essays um of a work of his called uh, child psychology and pedagogy and it really gives me the impression that like his under his understanding of the mirror stage and like the way he uh kind of messes more with like experimental psychology cognitive psychology and sciences and behaviorism somebody like you know piaget and other people um he is kind of a lot along the lines of a developmental thinker in, in the sense of like, he thinks of the subject in question as developmental and along the lines of perception and the perception of one's body and embodiment develops over time to determine their own understanding, not just freedom, but understanding because he's all about understanding. And we already know that Lacan is anti-developmental. His mirror stage is not a developmental theory. It's rather something of a retroactivity, right? Um, and the mirror stage can happen at any time. Uh, and he even says right here in the beginning about how like he wants to understand. His point is that we lack understanding, especially in his divergence from uh, communism and how like, I guess in this discussion, it's like if you, if you talk with, uh, in dialogue with, with uh, uh, these vulgar Marxists, pretty much there's just this lack of understanding. So his whole project moves from not only like a sort of political praxis, but also to sort of like, dialogue that leads to understanding so that way we can move forward maybe right. forward, but that's which it doesn't get more lib than that 
Yeah. No offense to Marlo yeah, Ponte. Yeah, that's but... exactly why. Like, you know, you know the shit that we always talk about. We need a dialogue. We need to collect the, need to collect the, the different perspectives. Come together. It's like we are the world. We are the children. Right. <laughs> what do they say? We are the ones to bring a brighter day. So let's right. start giving or whatever they yeah. say. We, or we are, we are the youth of the nation. <laughs> <laughs> Merlo Ponte's POD. <laughs> Merlo Ponte is POD. We all we got. That's all I'm saying. The thing is, Lacan is going to point out how dialogue cannot occur because his idea of intersubjectivity is not one in which both parties come to understand each other right. or in some sense they they don't like loop the same shoelace hole simultaneously and therefore generate anything from that which would lead to some meaningful change just through an exchange of signifiers Right, because that's like, not it, like that. That's not what he's getting at. Because exactly. the idea of repetition that he explores here is one that has no goal but its own self perpetuation. The thing with the Gestaltism, as he's going to say later on, is that it is an approximation, an adaptation. It implies that there's something out there. There is a good form of which we near through a kind of, uh, you know, endless um, sketching out of the different. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Convolutions that would eventually lead us to that form in its entirety in its like resplendent wholeness and that is not what he thinks repetition is it's sort of learning doesn't ultimately lead to a better understanding of any sort of quiescent reality beyond what we experience or doesn't explain phenomenology either. Like it doesn't explain phenomenology in terms of, like he says here, a, a faculty in which a drop of water, so long as it takes on a spherical form is on the same level. Is this something which requires that we always tend to perceive the approximate form we see as right. circular. What that means is that the, the, this faculty isn't fitted to an object, which is awaiting Right. It, it, it contact with it, right. which is a very platonic idea. This is the yeah. dyad that he's going to talk about a little yeah. bit later on. But this platonic idea that it's like our faculties, like on the along the divided line, every level of knowledge that there is, if you think of uh, there being a kind of correspondence between the epistemological side and the ontological side for every level of knowledge what there is to be perceived, there's a faculty that does the perceiving that is harmonious with it. Remember, Lacan is always going on about what doesn't work, what cannot work, and what um, is only possible via asymmetry. What that oh. means to me is that like he sees i feel like maybe tell me if i'm wrong but maybe merlo ponte might uh admit the importance of repetition but that that repetition doesn't really lead to anything more than a deepened and more deeply grooved let's say imaginary understanding of what it's after Right. So, and, and it's, this is, is, is true because of the fact that like, so his understanding of repetition, if he has one, 
um, or any term similar to that is still on a level of learning, understanding, uh, sort of pedagogy, but like not in like something like maybe psychoanalysis in relation to like the Mino, right? Or like something like uh, uh, De Magistro, right? With this transference. It's more along the lines of like a sort of behaviorism, uh, uh, experimental type thing, uh, a Pavlovian, Piaget type thing. Uh, and it's also because uh, his understanding of Freud is probably very, very crude. And he disagrees with anything like an unconscious, right? He takes the thing of like, he calls it ambivalence in the child psychology and pedagogy that is that the, the past is always in the present in the realm of possibility so long as that it remains in perception that like when you come into contact with things like, it's like, it's like for instance, um, you maybe walk into like, I don't know, uh, like a church, an old church, and then you get like this feeling of like, oh, it reminds me of like this moment where um, I was in Sunday school with my parents and they yelled at me, I don't know, like something like that. To him, that's an example of the past that follows the present. But it's nothing like the unconscious, right? Uh, where in order for you to enunciate it or, or in the compulsion to repeat and the transference, it's like you have to speak and, and to where the empty speech fails and there is the subject of enunciation. But it's only on the point that it always happens to fail in different ways, right? Because of learning for Lacan, there's failure. And, and so, like, here's the other thing, too, which I think is pretty interesting because you pointed out, right, that there's never really two parties where both are in a level of understanding because... Two body psychology. Is, exactly. I was just about to ask that. Doesn't that kind of allude to a two body psychology or a sort of thing that's like, well, like, you know, the... The, the, the psychologist, the therapist will have its own diagnosis uh, diagnosis of the patient right away, and at the same time, at the same time, also try to simultaneously understand while maintaining this like apparatus of capture based upon certain categories mm. of them, but still try to understand them, and then also be like, you know, you, I want you to understand me as well, like I'm your therapist, or like how CBT bros are like, you know, you can see me as your friend, or like just another friend, right? But like you could tell me like more, you know, I'm here to help you and, and make them feel at ease that they could feel understood and also be understanding about themselves. And this is not what Lacan is talking about, because you don't you don't understand your analyst just as much as they don't understand you. And in fact, on the, the level of the analyst and they don't think they're really trying to understand so much as they're trying to uh, demand especially when they fantasize about them, especially when it comes about like the OBJ, oh, the object cause of desire, that this analyst has this knowledge, right? In, in, the, in the analyst discourse, or even in when the, the patient becomes put in the hysterics discourse, they demand that knowledge for this attempt to be cured, right? Or a level of even erotic transference where they fall in love with them. They're not trying to understand them. They're trying to mutilate them, or they're trying to get a hold of something that they believe that they have and they demand it there's no yeah. there right when you said mutilation i always yeah. think of this great line from the sopranos where tony says can someone tell me what's wrong with me so they can rip it out right which is that's the demand i think it's in a medical context he's saying that yeah. but i love that idea that's the demand that people tend to bring to the oh, analytic fix situation fix me, fix me. Get rid of this one thing. Or can you tell me, am I crazy? You know, am I really? Yeah. Um, and, and obsessionals, right? They'll ask, like, do you care about me? Um, <laughs> you know, like, what do you, you know, think about it? Especially if, like, what if, like, somebody specializes in, like, I don't know, like, indigenous patients or, like, uh, transgender, et cetera. And then they get, like, a, a hysterical cis person, right, who's white, but then they feel like they're, kind of not seeing the same because of the fact that this person deals with like a different category of, of group subjects. And they're like, do, do you see me like you see your other patients? There's a demand right there of wanting to be recognized or included to be understood. Right, which is what I feel like most humanisms ultimately amount to is a 
moment of mutual recognition. Yeah. And, and, and look, Manoni even like piggybacks off of like what I said too about like this Darwin and Darwin type thinking. It's not like in a sense, like Darwin thought of this, it's this fact of this evolutionary thing in uh, perception and habit and repetition of learning that leads to like a better understanding and grasp on oneself, right? But what Lacan points out is though how this wonderful kumbaya moment in two body psychology in which two people truly recognize each other and are harmonized in that moment the desire for that is or let's say the demand for that is essentially selfish and as much as i think he says in seminar one that the patient attempts to secure i'm paraphrasing here of course but secure recognition of that which they themselves cannot see and recognize that is what the transference is in the sense that not just you have this knowledge, but you also, you ha- are, you stole something from me. You stole a part of me. The, the object is not just lost in a sense, but it's also stolen. And the figure of transference in some sense, they, they stole that from you. Right. When your, de- your demand to know for them to disclose their, secret knowledge is also to oh. get back the object that was stolen from you exactly and it's like the object you desire to be able to desire again and that's like where analysis starts is at the moment of the, the time of the transfer or the time of the analysis is where the transference occurs and that the patient recognizes the presence of the analyst as a subject supposed to know you know so And, and it's funny, it's like yeah. this whole notion of like, oh, you're talking about it like a kumbaya moment with this two-body psychology and like just like the this whole aspect of Marlou Ponty's like understanding. It's almost like, uh, you know, these two-body psychologists, bros, might as well do the fusion dance. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you want to be Gotenks, mm-hmm. but... We, ultimately you, together, right? We're you, think, together. you think you're Gotenks, but you're really Vegito. <laughs> everybody wants to be go tanks when they're really vegeto they want to do the fusion dance when really it's the Perunga earrings right that are affecting the <laughs> fusion and there's a time limit <laughs> that's, a mean that's all that's, that's a all mean. i'm saying <laughs> the two, two kinds of fusion <laughs> there you go I'm, I'm looking forward to that meme but <laughs> You know, this this is also an anti-progressivist narrative in the sense that it's so funny, this liberal notion of progress, because you can never really home in on what's progressed, how we have effectively distanced ourselves from our animal ancestors and what was the breaking point with nature and you you have so many different contradictory notions at play when we are relying on an evo devo evolutionary development right. sense of what society is and how we fit into it and what strides have been made since we were supposedly bonking each other on the head and dragging uh, ladies back to our caves. It's right. like, okay, when were we, when did we figure it out? Like at what point historically was it post enlightenment? Was it ancient Athens? There's always this allusion to a point uh, at which our evolution reached a kind of apex or was reaching an apex and then something went wrong. And now we are, devolving into uh, because of instant gratification our former animal form and it's like okay but you can't pinpoint a point a, a moment in time where we had really figured it out and more fully embodied the gestalt of what it means to be human it is the these kind of arguments are ultimately 
predicated on a fictive moment in the past that is non-specific and has to do with a kind of Weberian enchantment that has been lost. Why Freud is not a humanism is because what Freud is doing is not, not even redefining necessarily the essence or substance of man, but affecting a decentering to the extent that it's like the, the, the very, I don't want to say criteria, but the very categories that we're dealing with in a Kantian sort of sense are upended. They're blurred. They're mixed together. This is why Freud uh, mixes discourses together in a a very uh, heterogeneous sort of way because it's like, uh, well, is Freud a poet? Is he not? I really like, is it, it's not in this chapter, in another chapter, a little bit later on where Lacan says, um, well, when Freud talks about the navel of the dream, people think this is poetry. It isn't. He's not being poetic. Yeah. Now, of course, yes, in a sense he is, but the beauty of Freud with his mixing of, of, of discourse is in a kind of Joycean way. He's not doing it just for fun. His anatomical or his, uh, let's say anatomization of the psyche, which people scoff at and think of as like another form of phrenology, Right. Outmoded, just some sort of like Victorian relic. Even then, yes, it is an elaborate metaphor, but it isn't in the Delizian way that they say that the machine is not just a metaphor. What they mean by that is no, is it something that can be empirically proven? Can can we see the unconscious? Can we see the buffer zone that filters these energies? Can we see these? No. Why use these terms? Well, because what's happening is a kind of re-territorialization or a re reconfiguration of the playing field that we've been dealing with up until this right. point. Where man, where the human animal is located in that schema is, well... They aren't, in a sense. That's the beauty of it. It's kind of like, well, let's pursue this kind of re-schematization of everything to the end. And if we lose the individual, the post-Enlightenment or even Renaissance individual in the process, then so be it. That's right. the beauty of Freud. And I like how in your line of thought in, in, in model or dialogue just now of like... Uh, Freud's understanding of man is different from a humanism and not even making a conception of man in the, in the way of like Kant would do. Um, and how you started to bring up the navel of the dream. So I wanted to bring up the fact that it's like, it's always interesting how the, the two people that had the, the most interesting and still long lasting understanding of humanity are Freud and Marx, right? They're, understanding of a sort of building up a philosophical anthropology right not only that i want to add on to that you mentioned the navel of the dream who invented the symptom <laughs> there is a form of, of hermeneutics and interpretation <laughs> and Freud. but it's funny because that's just how what like somebody like a uh, uh, chiesa brings up is that what's great about marx and freud and why the freudal marxist line of thought works so well is because they were both on a sort of decentering this notion of man and sort of reformulating a new form of philosophical anthropology in that for Marx, it's a sort of uh, interhuman relationships with its system economically. And it's, it's, it's not species being, but in the sense of like, it's modes of production, right? And how the, the mode of production also creates a new form of consciousness new forms of, of, of sciences within the consciousness ideas, but also a sort of alienation as well. And now I'm paraphrasing. I don't think he said all that, but you could kind of get the gist of it. And with Freud, it's like a decentering of man 
based on the notion of the unconscious, that's also something that's overdetermined. Um, and in the sense that there is a level of desire that and drives that take precedence in this sort of libidinal economy that Bennett delved into. What, yeah, no, I, I love what you're saying with this decentering. And what's funny about it is there is a kind of lip service paid to nominal decenterment within the whole liberal attitude of being like anti anthropocentric in some <laughs> sense where it's kind of like, well, you know, people think that they're the center of the universe and they're the only life form in existence when in reality we inhabit this larger ecosystem and i'm not saying that's not true of course it's true but they they think that that's some profound right. observation to say that and it's like well first of all whenever anyone talks about and i do it too we all do it but like humanity as a whole people you have to wonder okay who is the subject being referred to here exactly. and then Okay, so you think that you're decentering the place of the, uh, of man in some sense by saying this, but what's funny is that in our smallness, in the recognition of ourselves as just a tiny moat floating in space, the tiniest of tiny things, and we're so insignificant there's still a right a, 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 how would i put like there's still an aggrandizement of the individual oh, yeah. in that it's like no the real because the real genius of freud is to re remove the what we were talking about before the to, to eliminate the totalizing tendencies of these kind of syntheses that go into the conception of what the human individual is. And like in exactly what you're saying, Andrew, like in the Marxian uh, notion of the of commodity fetishism or the worker understanding the locus of the individual as being equal to the network of social relations in the case of Marx that mark the place of, of the worker, or in the case of Freud, let's say the, how would we want to put it? Like a knot of, of symptoms, uh, a synthome, even though he didn't have that concept, of course, that, you know, I don't want to like anachronistically attribute that to, but you know, avant la lettre or whatever, but <laughs> the uh, unconscious place of, of, of the subject, which is, there is no place of the subject and the, the unconscious is not located anywhere, but the unconscious is because it speaks and because it invokes a network of relations right. that, only exists in the moment of its invocation. Yes, in and, and it's, it's taken itself into account as we looked at in like two chapters ago, right? You know, or is it three chapters ago? You know, uh, you know, the, the my brothers, uh, who was it? I forget the name. Paul, but, Ernest, Paul and, and me, <laughs> my three brothers. <laughs> it's like when uh, I love my one of my favorite parts of. Uh, seminar one is when Lacan says that to say I am me is no different from, I think, uh, someone, a Bororo uh, tribe identifying themselves with a parrot. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so our homie Hippolyte, ever, ever, the, uh, ever the naysayer, not really of Lacan trying to introduce a sort of uh, elucidation okay. here says, you know, well, okay, but we have this conception of the libido there. I guess here when he says asserts clearly the broader and broader in to 
integration of organisms. He's trying to liken what Freud's doing to a kind of gestaltism. Right. Would you say that that's the case? It seems like, yeah, because he's like so confused about like libido and death instinct, how like they, they're two uh, opposition, oppositional drives, right? Um, I guess what he's trying to say, yeah, like what is more ill-defined uh, which uh, the fine, what does he say right? Oh, let me read it right here. But he says, like, I am not at all challenging the crisis described by Freud, but opposed, but he opposes the libido to the death instinct, just like back then he opposed the libido from the ego drive, right? And he defines it as a tendency of the organism to come together with other, or other organisms as if to constitute a progress integration. So independently of this undeniable conflict of which you speak and which doesn't make him an optimist from the human point of view, we nevertheless find in him a conception of the libido, what is more ill-defined, which asserts clearly the broader and broader integration of the organisms. Freud says it quite succinctly in the text himself. And I think, yeah, it's like what he's trying to say is like, oh, like, you know, does the libido try to seek some type of synthesis of unity, even with, you know, the contradiction of death drive? And I think that's like what Lacan is trying to shut down of the fact it's like, no, there's no like sort of synthesis or, or unity or anything like that. Yeah, that would lead to like some sort of ego psychology, you know, because if there is this relationship between libido and it drives and ego drives, and then you now posit something new, which is death drive, which was not necessarily explicit in like on narcissism Freud and three essays of sexuality Freud, transference love Freud, but you know, the blueprints were there to create, you know, a final formulation in this investigation of, of beyond the player principle. Now now we get into a very finely textured argument which we talked about already and you explained beautifully to me before, which is the way that the pleasure principle and death drive are not opposed, but the manner in which the death drive actually helps the pleasure principle along and how the death drive just is, it's a sad fact of reality And then the pleasure principle, though, is something we interpret in a sense. This is how I understand it. It's like the pleasure principle needs interpretation to be instituted. And it's like it has its uh, platonic um, antecedents throughout the history of philosophy, whereas the death drive just is. And so it's like dialectically so, but it just is. And it's like there is this linkage between the two because it's like if if drives are trying to aim towards their satisfaction, the only thing they never aim at the object of satisfaction is really like they aim at themselves, it seems like, right? Um, the compulsion to repeat and to sort of create um a scenario uh or the scene for which not only the compulsion to repeat, but also the repetition of mastery, there is this enjoyment of constantly repeating it, even if it undermines its own aim, that the pleasure part in the death drive constantly comes back to a sort of similar scene to learn something new, which of course, you know, we'll get in later with the the funny joke that he has to say to compare when it comes to learning. But, um, you know, in essence, this is where we kind of get into a sort of embryonic, well, I want to say embryonic, because it's not developmental, if you take Todd Allen's words in that, like, Lacan is not a developmental thinker. He's saying the same thing with different terms, but the whole thing of, like, uh, enjoyment and jouissance, right, there is that in the compulsion to repeat, right? Instead of calling it the pleasure principle, it's just jouissance of the death drive what about this here though i think it's really interesting how this restitutive tendency is not at first clearly distinguishable 
from the repetitive tendency? Because would you say that the restitutive tendency is pleasure principle and the repetitive tendency is death drive or what he's calling death instinct, right? Right. And it doesn't seem as clear, but it's like, well, the death drive is trying to restore that scene to, again, repeat. Because look at Fort Da. Like, there is this restoration of a sort of, um, I guess so I'll use the term primal scene of the kid trying to recreate the memory of his mother leaving him and by projecting out or throwing out those toys only to bring them back in, right? And then with the silk reel doing the same thing. These are ways of compulsion to repeat, but also a restoration for the, not just for the, the, the unconscious, but also like the overall scenario for it to fail. Because there's this sort of like not only mastery, but it's like if this mastery is like aimed at trying to understand, trying to enjoy. And so here we get into Maru Ponzi's like understanding always fails, right? I think the interesting thing to me is that it's easy enough to oppose the death drive to the pleasure principle in the sense that, oh, it's that which undermines our own conceptualizations of what our activity leads to, what we're doing. You think you're doing one thing, but you're actually doing another thing. When really the idea that the death drive helps the pleasure principle along and that maybe this is just me hazarding a theory here, but the pleasure principle is only able to procure any degree of pleasure because of the death drives help in a sense it's like yeah, yeah, it's only true. through the kind of repetition that any pleasure is taken i'm i'm thinking of something that zupancic said once which i thought was really interesting which is that when like okay if you think about eating eating is a, a kind of oral fixation the repetition of chewing is one of the ways the drive seeks its satisfaction it's not something necessarily separate from the pleasure that's taken though in eating. You have a moment or obvious, the obvious example is the baby uh, on, on its mother's breast, right? Who's being breastfed, who's feeding. It's like, okay, it reaches, it gets its nourishment and then it keeps sucking the breast for the enjoyment of sucking the breast. But here's the thing. There isn't necessarily a clear cutoff point from just the need being satisfied and then continuing with the repetitive action of sucking necessarily. It's like the rip to me, the way I would see it is like a kind of Hegelian reversal is you posit the uh, repetitive action as almost prior to the pleasure itself in in some ways or or the need itself this is something kies also talks about where it's like even the concept of need which we think of as like you start with need and then you get all these sorts of weird um you know uh distortions right of it but Fire. But even need itself becomes symbolically situated. Exactly. That's what's interesting. Right. Yeah. And, and need is sort of like a sort of retroactive even myth. It's like the same thing of like when we talk about like the whole yeah. thing, use of value and, and, and exchange value. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. It's, it's just like it's, it can only be known retroactively. Right. And in the session, it's like need gets confused with desire because like when a patient, like a neurotic an obsessional no longer can desire the way that they do, they go in. It's not only that they want to desire like they used to, they need to, to be normal, to be how they were, to be themselves, right? Because they have this uh, understanding of somehow a constitution of wholeness that they're 
They are aware that they're lacking, but they want it back and they need it back. So there isn't always a clear distinction between need, demand, and desire. Not for the neurotic, it seems like. Not for the neurotic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is like also there's a little, little bit of uncertainty, right? Because the thing is, the psychotic, you know, if they go in analysis, they're not duped. And in, in fact, this is something that's really enlightening by the homie Jason, uh, shout out to the homie Jason Childs. If you don't know who that is, follow him on Instagram if you need an analysis. Hit him up on IG, Jason Childs. But that in the transference, right, the, the psychotic is not new, but they feel like that they are that big other, that they have knowledge to actually teach the an, the analyst themselves. So they want the analyst to be some type of secretary and kind of like write down what they say to teach them. Like if they have this mystical experience. And I kind of brought down this metaphor of like, well, if you look at Schraber, right, because even though Schraber wasn't analyzed himself by Freud, you know, and, and neither Lacan, but he believed that he was endowed with this knowledge when he had these psychotic episodes and hallucinations and seeing God and thinking he was going to get fucked by God to recreate humanity, but in his memoirs, hoping that he could contribute to the realm of theology and possibly science, but no, ended up being in the hands of psychoanalysis. But that certainty that this is going to be a work of theology, that he's got something to contribute that he has this knowledge. That's the difference between a psychotic and uh, a neurotic's discourse. There's a sense of certainty. Yes, and this notion of need, doubt, or need, uh, lack, want, demand, or whatever you want to use these terms, there's always going to be a sort of gap of uncertainty with the neurotic. And that's why they depend on the analyst and yeah. the knowledge. The you could say the psychotic is almost undesiring. Right, right, right. Almost like not that they don't desire, but it's like they don't desire like to like be metaphorized or to put signifiers or whatever. Desire, desire is metaphorical and met yeah. metonymic ultimately. Yeah. It's, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, most definitely. Whereas they are completely no Freudian pun intended, abreast of the process <laughs> of metonymy. Yeah. I feel like psychosis. Uh, I'm, I'm more inclined to say that it's uh, more object relations, but. <laughs> 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 no, that was good. <laughs> I'm more inclined. Uh, the psychotic is almost like metonymy in action. It's right. like metonymy incarnate yeah. without the possibility of like metaphorization because the metaphor is predicated upon a, a kind of absence. Whereas for the psychotic, um, there is no real absence in reality. That's the horrific thing is that reality is too full. If you think about Schraber, it's like his life hit, his accounts of what he's experiencing are, are that of like a complete fullness, a plenitude of reality. Uh, not, not the, the absence that the neurotic must introduce endlessly into their experience in order for their desire to be sufficiently remote. Right. Yeah. Most definitely. But I think we're, Getting a little bit off course. Um, We're on which page now? All Maybe. right, <laughs> we've we really haven't made too much progress here, but I mean, we're definitely tying a lot of ideas, like usual. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about this last time. Uh, this idea of entropy, the pleasure principle, as right. aimed at ultimately death, the cessation of life and how that as a terminal point can be used from a biological point of view to explain discharge of energy the way that machines work only via a sufficient management of the energy that they produce. So it, 
a machine doesn't just work because it, or not produces energy is fueled by a kind of energy is, right. and it generates excess energy in the midst of that. And it needs to be able to deal with the excess energy that it uh, produces in order to at least function for a specific period of time. Yeah. Cause that's why like, we look at an engine that has exhaust. Cause that's where the excess energy goes. Right. Um, and like, uh, for instance, like, um like even even like m like a mechanical machine it, it's not that it even just contains energy but produces energy but it's it itself is a sort of energy that's moving so it's like there is this dependency on the energy of the machine and the fact that the machine itself does have a sort of schematic and that's what he was saying like you know you have equations for understanding of building the engine to um uh, building an entire like um a uh, motor controller to uh, activate a pump or something like that. But you have like, you know, whether it's the difference between the mechanical or electrical, they're both have a sort of schematic or equations for them that allow you to quantify and actually understand, oh shit, how energy works versus like what we said, like, oh, like, you know, uh, not knowing like that the slave, well, because of like more slave societies, they didn't understand or calculate like the notion of en energy or expenditure, right? They just thought, oh, it happens to be the fact that you know it's by nature that slaves wore out, get old, and die. But with machines, it's they break down and need to be fixed. You and can't help, you can't help but think about the concept of constant capital here, right. in the need to, and Althusse, of course, with his concept of. Um, you know, the maintenance of modes of production has right. to be factored right. into production itself. Exactly. In it's like what we would call overhead. If you're running a business mm -hmm. is a, a major consideration and the um, duration of, of machines like usefulness, the law of thermo thermodynamics as he defines it here is sort of you know you have a what you put into the rabbit that you put into the magician's hat or what what does he say like a, about yeah, the yeah yeah putting uh, the rabbit that you pulled out and put back into the magician's hat or, the rabbit that you pulled out of the hat you put there in the first place yeah, which is that like yeah. there is a certain quantum of energy uh, that is put into the machine which the machine processes and has to discharge a um th this the same amount i guess right. if i yeah, understand it like, like a, a, a like the the quantum the, uh, the theoretical understanding of like for instance hydraulics by like uh you know pascal you know it, it must be put into a machine where it could be put into practice or be re revealed in the first place it seems like if i'm getting that that whole analogy correct but here's what's really interesting about it, though, is that we focus on the second principle of, of thermodynamics, which has to do with amount of entropy, right? That expands and, and is in disorder. I don't know. I just know that Isaac Asimov story. <laughs> what's it called? The final something or other. It's a good story about uh, the inevitability or uh, inexorability of entropy right and also that's shout out to this is your homie carlos meyer a doctor in the navy <laughs> yeah that's came right. up with capital e entropy <laughs> probably like uh was it was he yeah he was american right was he i don't know i have no idea this is the first i'm hearing of this guy but here's what's great about lacan is that you could miss something very important because he's so casual in the way yeah he it's the most nonchalant thing he's like, like the, so the nonchalant <laughs> he's just like there's no mystery to entropy it's a symbol the thing you can write on the blackboard right that's the important thing though i feel like to hang on to right. it's a symbol entropy is symbolic <laughs> it's not i think that's more interesting than calling it a law Right. It's a symbol. It's an important symbol. Right. It's a guiding principle, but it's a symbolic guiding principle. 
Exactly. And it's indispensable to our thinking. And that goes for what he says is like all models towards the end, right? All models, you know, are just like imaginary things that have some sort of symbolic function or that, that needs symbolic creation to begin with. Um, but it's important that like, even though they're just symbols, it's like these symbols help function to create a model of understanding for, again, psychoanalysis. Death drive is a symbol for a model of understanding how the compulsion belief operates. So, and it's the way that how we, we compare it to what entropy is, is like this, so, this sort of disorder um, of energy and it's need to sort of be uh, reduced to a minimum, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Like that's the point of the pleasure principle is to reduce down to a minimum. <sighs> Also because the when you said when you mentioned death drive there make a good point because death drive doesn't exist in the way other things exist. Death drive is a, a provisional explanation for a relation between two poles, but and it it's eternally provisional. Right. That's the paradox of it, is that it must be invoked to explain a relation between two poles is how I would describe it. And yet it can't be done away with. It's like the same thing with exchange value. You have commodity A and the series of other commodities that gives it its value in order to bring the two in relation, you need to invoke this concept of exchange as if it's something that just mediates the relation between two things that are more real than the exchange itself. But then exchange becomes the most real thing, whereas the commodity is mutable. I feel like it's the same with death drive as being that which explains the relation between culture and nature, but becomes, in some sense, even though it's introduced to explain a gap becomes more real than that which it brings into relation with one another. Yes. Bars. Someone also, we're looking for an intern to clip up these episodes because we're too lazy to do it. We know we got some gems here. <laughs> you wanna, or if you want to at least give us some timestamps or something, right, right, right. It is a crime against humanity that we don't have more listeners because we're just we're we're spitting endless bars, yeah. and <laughs> we're giving you for free something that um, you know the people who attended these seminars well, they worked hard to be born into the kind of wealth, yeah, that. <laughs> Let them be a part of this obscenely bourgeois spectacle that is the <laughs> seminars. Uh, I like what he says here too. You might think I'm anti-organicist. And this is, I think what's interesting about what Lacan's saying here is that often you might, like some people might confuse what the, the 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 proceedings here with a kind of anti organicist anti scientific point of view in the sense well it's like oh well we have our precious dialectic which isn't scientific it's not anything right. it's the only real thing that there is and he's saying no 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 it's it's i i am or an organicist in my own way but ordinary organicism is a stupidity yeah, yeah. And and like when you look at him, he talks about like, you know, you can't really understand biology or like even the body without knowing that it's already marked by signification or, or like a body or, or organism that's already thrown into language. With us, it's like we're thrown in a machine that also takes a life on its own. Right? We're not jammed machines, which is what, uh, you know, he talks about animals. And it's like, you know, it's not even just the fact that his interpretation of organicism versus like, um, you know, like a zoologist or something like that is the fact of like, they think like, oh, these animals are killing each other for survival. But it's more the fact it's like, not just a thing about survival, 
and versus like maintaining the species while one is a little weaker one that dies off but it's rather the fact that they're caught in like certain spectacles that somehow have the contingency of making them procreate but it never goes anything further even you know some apes you know in in, in like other other sort of primates they do have their own type of way of communicating they use tools and stuff like that um they wrestle but it's not on the level of like creating um you know modes of productions right some type of symbolic exchange gift economy slave economy that's something that is not organicist in the you know sort of uh crude biologist zoologist type thing you know like it, this is the, puts in the question like you know jordan peterson's like you know there's something that's natural about dominance hierarchies like you know no, oh, well, what about you know slave? Uh, not just a dominant hierarchy. What about a slave economy, right? Can you take an account of that? Is that natural? <laughs> Animals don't have slaves. Yeah, they have parasites attached to them. They're but supposedly yeah. symbiotic relations, right? But the a desire to enslave the other is something that is purely imaginary or actually, no, not purely imaginary. That's wrong. It is the interpenetration of the symbolic with the imaginary that's going on there. And I see you kind of smiled when I said interpenetration because <laughs> well, I don't, I don't want to know what's on your mind there, but But it's a phallus joke. <laughs> so how how how? So if if the the symbolic order is a kind of circuit, and he makes that clear from the title, of course, but also talking about the Bell Telephone Company, right. Mob Bell. I um, it's a very interesting, you know, aspect it, of the dialogue. This, this is something that Zizek also does, which I think is is really interesting, where instead of talking about the internet as something new and different that came out of nowhere, that's completely unprecedented, he'll talk about our virtual persona right the way that we're we're plugged in to to the web in this way is just a kind of amplification of a scenario that has always existed it's just an acceleration right. of that yeah but it I isn't mean, something it's new always there right just like energy it's like energy did not exist it existed but it just didn't exist in the way that we can now quantify it or put it into like a sort of imaginary understanding with concepts right and and with let's say the invention of the telephone and the system of wires that that necessitated we have a completely new thing that is very much old in the sense that it only sets in relief that which is most material in our interactions with one another. It just receives a further pronunciation in the structure introduced hereof he uses the kind of uh let's say uh, sim simile of the economization of communication with uh, these telephone wires to in some sense give expression to the exact dynamic of 
communication. Right. But what he points out that's really interesting is that there the materiality of language fully emerges here because this is a really brilliant insight. Think about it. It's like, if you think about language as merely the container of meanings and we are trading these encapsulating encapsulated meanings all the time, then you lose sight of the material of what they're made of. If, right. you, if you didn't believe that they were made of a certain material, then what are power lines in this case? Because he's saying something needs to be transmitted. We could say anything at all, but there is a kind of material uh, to the, that is being transmitted back and forth by means of these power lines. And it's through these power lines that the, the real materialization of this material comes to the fore, becomes very much obvious. Exactly. And, and like, you know, words on their own don't exist in a vacuum. Like, you know, there's no meta language, but like the, the you know, one of the language always like, you know, first of all, like a fucking, some type of evolutionary thing. It's like, oh, you know, the way the words of language happen is because a certain part of our brain where it connects the vocal cords and we modulate just this voice. Fine, yeah, you know, primordially, but it doesn't really account for signification in the relationship to the, the vocal cords, whatever, and the sounds that we enunciate, right? I'm not trying to reduce it to just freaking utter guttural sounds, right? That's like a reductionist. But we can see as like the first economization of you know uh speech or communication but like when you look at like indigenous tribes you know the way that like speech is not just the fact that just some modulating but it's in rituals in in sort of dances and then oral traditions of stories and then you get writing and then um we have like the printing press but then we get like he's talking about like telephones and stuff like that and, and then telegrams as well and then it's the fact that like signs in a referential system of, of language and, and communication, whether it's understanding or not, is it's not the it's not the issue, right? And he even says like it's not a matter of understanding, but the fact of just the communication of relaying of a message and, and information in relation to energy. Um, there's still a material relationship to it. Look at us now. What are we doing? We are literally communicating through a signal with Wi-Fi mediated by computers and cell phones, etc. It's literally just an exacerbation of it. Absolutely. And it only gains different uh, forms of quantification through all of these different channels that have been opened up by new forms of technology. But that doesn't mean that anything in any sense has been newly entified right. right or that some a a a new primary color has been introduced into the spectrum right. which is what yeah. we imagine the internet to be and it's like it's funny when you look at like you know uh kaczynski bros like technology is you know terrible yada 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 but it's like we're all we're in we're thrown into like signification and, and the way we create things out of the symbolic order. There's no such thing as uh, no technology. We are always having tools that not only are technology, but also create new forms of economy. I mean, look at kids with like uh, making forts, tree houses, you know, like old school 80s movies or the fucking paper cup with the string and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me Telephone, like yeah, whisper down the lane or something like that. <laughs> what makes what makes that game fun is the fact that meaning gets lost in the process of transmitting wow. a message. And you see, like I always thought that game was hilarious because it's like the fungibility of language is the motor of that game in some sense. Right. And it's like, 
what Lacan is saying. And but here's the thing that to, to understand them is that this isn't just um what Peterson might say, well, this is just a sort of anti anti-meta narrative postmodern argument, which just shows the absolute relativism of all meaning. And without and the relativism of all meaning is that this already sounds better than anything he would say, but like is going to lead to the destruction of certain Judeo-Christian bonds between people. No, the thing is, this doesn't just amount to like all oh, language and meaning is relative, dude. Like it doesn't it's like there's no because yeah. because there's not a general essential consensus on what anything means. Right. That's not and what he's saying neutral, either. And there's never a neutral position. The whole point is that, and this is why someone like Zizek always quotes Lacan as saying there is no big other, which isn't to say that you see behind the veil of some of the big other to what really is, or the fact that we're only dealing with this like multiplicity of meanings that, or a multiplicity of, um, insignificant. I mean, like non-signifying elements that only take on the guise of signification. What he's saying is that, yes, there is no ultimate totalizing site wherein all of these different signifiers take on some absolute meaning, but at the same time, there is such a thing as symbolic efficiency. So the big other is symbolically efficient. It is very much alive and binding to the degree that we invest in it. And that does, that doesn't mean that language depends on its reference, but rather that I would say the, the circulation of these meanings is essential to, or the circulation of these signifiers is essential to there being something like a social body. Right. Um, but it's not what I think, Merleau Ponty is saying we're like we need to find common ground with people who disagree with us. And yeah. And, it, and, and, that's and, not it either, because there is no yeah. real common ground. Yeah. And this or like position of reference point of perception that leads to better understanding. And yeah, probably a common ground as well. Um, and it's like, well, if 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 like Lacan doesn't believe that's the case, but you know. For the Mulo Ponti, if that's not the case, then all language just, just seems to vanish. But that's Lacan's like, no, you know, because again, when we talk about what this is in relation to, it's in relation to an analytic session. There is no common ground between the analyst and right. the analyst. The analyst doesn't understand who you are. They're not diagnosing you. They shouldn't, right? They ought not to. They are there to listen and they are there to be silent. And of course, the the, the analyzant can very much provoke, entice, and do things and act out, even yell at, because they're not feeling understood, or they're demanding like you're a doctor, you went to school, like all these like lashing out, you should be this. The way I understand, like, they're speaking from a level of not only just projection and preconceived notions, but also that they believe that they understand what an, an analyst ought to be doing. So therefore, it the analyst is put in a position of like, well, if you're like a CBT thing, it's like, I understand how you feel, right? And uh, what I'm seeing is, is analysts would not be provoked at all. You know, if they would respond to anything, so what do you imagine me to be doing right now to you? You're saying all this, and I should be doing this. Um, what do you imagine an analyst to be doing in your understanding? That's hysterization right there. That puts the analyst back into them pre associating, which is not on a level of understanding, right? It's more on a level of allowing them to pre associate while still knowing that you'll never understand because the point is that the analyst is not trying to understand the patient, but providing the, the area to allow them to free associate and, and 
help them create, you know, or the historicization of the subject, I guess. This seems far removed from our subject, as Lacan says here. How are we going to meet up with the subject again? I like. I would like to point out also this idea of, I had to look this up, Maxwell's demon. Right. I've heard about that, but I, I don't really know what it, it has something to do with the law of thermo, thermodynamics, where if you have like said a bunch of like molecules moving around, then like you quickly open a door, the faster molecules will slip into like, imagine there's a door between two chambers and the faster molecules will like, slip into that other chamber and then one chamber will be really cold and the other one will be hot and somehow it like violates the law of thermo thermodynamics mm. what does that mean i don't know but i guess it has something to do with sort come um, problematizing the idea of this discharge as being equal to what's put into it. Right. Okay. That's the only, yeah, that's the only thing that I could deduce from that, but I, I'm not exactly sure. He doesn't mention it again. I'm not sure that we're capable of taking it up. Okay. Only with Lacan can you go from Maxwell's demon to Lucretius and then later Back to Kierkegaard. The and then, yeah. I love it. <laughs> this is why, whether you think he's full of shit or the most brilliant man to ever have li lived, like you have to give him credit for the, um, right. the, the, the beauty of the strange mixing together of, of different kinds of, of discourse, which I was talking about before, but I love this line, this libido, isn't it something rather libidinous? <laughs> isn't the beat? <laughs> what do you think, Andrew? Is the libido something rather libidinous? Yeah, it's definitely libidinous. It's libidinal nature. I would say so. <laughs> you know, we have, it's interesting because we have this idea of the pleasure principle whether we realize it or not, as that which governs all of our activities and pursuits in life. What we do, we imagine, aims at something. Right. But yeah, no, but that's, it's in, in, in as funny as that, that thing is, isn't the libido quite libidinous? He's literally emphasizing the fact that libido is aimed at pleasure, right? Satisfaction. It's not aimed at, again, Jung, psychic investment, metamorphosis and transformation. It's not, it is sexual. But what is sought in the end is also the cessation of pleasure. This is confusing on the surface of it because it's kind of like, well, let's say the pleasure principle itself has a certain demand. It doesn't really because it's ultimately in many ways, like I mentioned before, helped along by the death drive, but it's sort of like if it had a demand, it would be like, kill me. Right. <laughs> Stop me from this seeking of pleasure because it's like what's, what Sophocles said, that the best thing ever would probably be to never have been born. Right. Uh, it's it's literally like Arnold Schwarzenegger in front of the, the predator. Kill me. Kill me now. <laughs> <laughs> Kill me now. <laughs> exactly. It's like the cessation of pleasure, but it would be great to never be put in that position in the first place of having to make pleasure cease, and that would be never existing. Uh, but we do exist, unfortunately. And the pleasure principle, the principle of pleasure, is that pleasure should cease. I love this part too, but then what about the reality principle? People like to bring up the reality principle and just kind of subsume it under the pleasure principle where it's kind of like, well, if you do too much pleasure seeking, get your fingers burnt, you get the clap, yeah. your face <laughs> smashed in, you know, Lacan had the clap. 
And this is what human learning described to us. And this is what people will say about instant, this culture of instant gratification that we live in where people get their, their kicks immediately. They're, everyone likes to say, Oh, I got my dopamine hit. Right. Right. Looking at these likes and everything. And it's sort of, you know, as if you know what's going on chemically inside of you and you know very well that you should be pursuing higher things and that you should be cultivating something. You should be going to jujitsu or reading Lacan or doing things that are important rather than just getting your, your dopamine fix. And yet you're addicted. And there, what Lacan is saying is though that reading Lacan or doing jujitsu or going on Instagram all day, there's no real qualitative difference. It's a, yeah. it's a question of how you space out the libidinal charges you get from one versus yeah. the other it, in a sense. Like with, I think like I want to write something on instant psychoanalysis. Like it's the fact it's like most of the, the personality of, of two is like, one who's obsessed with psychoanalysis, or one who's in, invested in psychoanalytic theory, or as like a practitioner, but also learning. And then one in jujitsu are both on a level of obsessionality. Like they're both obsessional people, right? It's not a level of like, oh, these are just higher things that one ought to be doing than seeking instant gratification. No, it's rather just a sublimation, and it's pretty much still on a level of just being able to be obsessional without undermining oneself, pretty much. <laughs> but what? is going on here though is this idea of like a friend of mine said the other day that something to the effect that civilization is the product of deferred pleasure which isn't wrong necessarily but we tend to uh glorify the reality principle in as much as we think that the the discipline that is the deferral of pleasure in some sense uh, renews the spirit gives you some kind of superiority in a sense in 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 the uh, reading seminars one and two commentary like the whole essay on the like civilization discontent and like the civilization of hatred it's like you know even though there's this supposedly deferred pleasure for like you know, the the ability to have a social bond, it, it actually in this the, this contingency of that reads like in a sense the grounds for the deferred pleasure to be more permissible. And if you look at the way capitalism has you know instantiated itself in the late stage, all these things that in the the classical Freudian analysis of like not even Freud himself, but like these like like these neo Freudians, Marcusians, that's like oh like this deferred pleasure. No, like look at there is an entire fucking app or website called Pornhub, which all your sexual gratifications could be freaking fantasized and, and in a sense obsessed and transgressive in this shit or these different kinks and fetishes of like on Instagram, e-girls, goth girls, et cetera, like thimbos, which are completely sexualized or to get even worse, that the prison system and the fact that it's supposed to stop criminals and, and those that break the law actually create more criminality and more violence, right? Police brutality, et cetera. And yet it's still being reproduced rather than say we need to defer these pleasures that are supposed to be violent and actually you know destroy civilization as we know it it's like actually no there's this dialectic dialectical antagonism of this right here yeah i think we live in a culture of sort of endless deferral if you think about it right so also think about having like 20 tabs open on pornhub (laughs) you're deferring something Right. Trying to, find, trying to find that favorite video. <laughs> the Coomer archetype. The Coomer is that is, is the master of deferral. They have ritualized deferral to a point of like knowing exactly how to be gratified in the best way possible. It's like actually we live in a 
we live in an era with that is hell bent on gratification, but I wouldn't say it's instant. I wouldn't yeah. say anything is actually instant, even though we think we live in this time of like, oh, everything's instant. You can order Grubhub and you can go on Pornhub and you can do this and that and YouTube. And it's just like, well, yeah, but the gratification isn't even there. It doesn't well, come. There's an yeah, instant, there's an instantaneity to it, but it the gratification isn't it. <laughs> and you could say it always comes with the guilt or shame. Like for instance, like Grubhub or like DoorDash, it's like, I could have just drove over to the fucking McDonald's drive through and instead I paid an extra 20 bucks for, you know, the tax and for like the delivery fee. Like, I feel like a piece yeah. of shit. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. Like, or like, you know, just the fact it's like the stupid meme about like, you know, triple N because <laughs> we're in November. It's like, I can't believe I went on one of <laughs> just to be vulgar. <laughs> right. Sorry for the trigger warning, by the way, for our audience, you know. <laughs> We can get out of hand. Well, we've been we've been vulgar, but it's, it's kind of hard to talk about this stuff without yeah. talking about you know like yeah, organizing. Yeah, like juicance literally means orgasm. By the way, psychoanalysis so allows you to uh, you know allow yourself to not to enjoy. So don't even Which, enjoy your triggers because exactly, that exactly. That's the fat. That is what to me is really revolutionary here. Potentially revolutionary is the idea. It's like what does that even mean? Yeah. Uh, we don't even understand when you first hear that you're allowed to not enjoy. Yeah. It doesn't even make sense. You're like, what, what does that mean? The idea is that it's not delayed gratification. It's not the deferral of enjoyment. It's you are allowed to not enjoy. You're given permission. When you think about the permissibility of enjoyment in our society it's like we live in this time of permissive sexual mores supposedly where everything is allowed as zizek often points out we are paralyzed by our own desires in that case because we have nothing to transgress against when you're the one thing we aren't given permission to do is to not enjoy whether it's enjoyment of our own suffering whether we are in love with the signifier of depression whether we love calling ourselves depressed identifying with it right or whether we're toxically positive for example right. either way it's the same thing the idea is an analysis. There is no expectation whatsoever of how you're supposed to act, exactly. what you're supposed to say. And if, and, and not, and here's the thing, not enjoying is not the same thing as being miserable because that's a form of enjoying. Exactly. The question is what is not enjoying? Yeah. What even is that? Yeah. Who knows? Well, yeah, because one person could be like, you know, you get like a group of people like at a roller coaster and they're all excited. And you got that one person that's like, <clears throat> yeah. right? I'm not enjoying this. But even though like, you know, then why did you even show up if you don't enjoy this? Right. There is a sense of enjoyment. In yes. Saying that you hate something, right? Absolutely. And that's the thing. Dislike and hate. And we, Sheldon George talks about the jouissance of racism, right? Of, of hating the other, but there's this sort of ambivalence within it needing that other to participate in something so you could hate them and create this fantasy right and um it's different than having that sort of deferral position that allows you to not enjoy and then even speak freely because it's like well and i was just thinking about this as you were talking but it's like could you imagine you get like the most person that says like 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 could you imagine a reactionary person going to analysis, like some like conservative that's like, oh, these, you know, liberal LGBTQ blue haired feminists are taking away freedom of speech and the Jews and yada, yada. Well, if you take them in analysis, right, and, you know, say whatever's on your mind, could you imagine how they would feel under that pressure of like, wait, I could say anything I want. And to be able to express that without this sort of like, you don't have the right to say this, yada, yada, you're okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Without, how much they would reduce themselves and wait, 
this is what I really feel, or like the resistance, the silence that comes. Right. No, I re- I really like that. Yeah, I, that's brilliant because it's what do you do when? Because isn't that the reactionary lament there against the uh, supposedly like prohibitive apparatus of of libtard culture is that they're stopping me from saying but in what well here's the question first of all in what context i'm i was talking to a friend who uh is african-american grew up in a mostly white uh rural town and just just for fun is like hanging out at his friend's cabin in a mostly white rural town. And like, so far he has been in like three situations where the N word was used, not even like maliciously, so to speak, but like in in terms of just like certain expressions they use that just casually have that word in them. It's crazy. It's not so much like that word being thrown at him. Like people were generally pretty, have been pretty nice to him. And yet they like casually use that in certain contexts. And he was, you know, kind of taken aback by that. But that's all to say it's sort of like in these communities, in these rural communities, it's like, let's say, you know, the N word, for example, it's used, it's there, and it's un, its usage is unregulated. What is the supposed context in which this can't be said where it could have? been said in the past like not just that word but certain things could be said well in like the media landscape in the media context but these aren't even people who are represented in the media now we but what does that sound like representation so you see how it's like you're inevitably you're inevitably drawn into a what what does that sound like when you hear representation by a liberal discourse Right, so and it seems like, like that's that's it, what like the whole elephant uh, signifier is like to them. It's like they want to be able to manipulate it without them being in the room, right? They could do whatever they want, talk about oppression, talk about that. It's a PMC tape, right? And but isn't it, like a Marxist but, thing, but like that, yeah, like. But isn't there like a direct correlate? Isn't it just mere image in the reactionary version of it? Is is the reactionary? embrace of a kind of christo fascist signifier doesn't it still obey the same logic as the pmc take it's absolutely just as pmc as anything else because they still take the position of being the victim in their own way now this might not seem exactly related to what we're talking about here but i think it is to the degree that what you were saying before which i love the idea of this reactionary guy who of feels like oh, I can't, people can't say anything anymore. Like jokes aren't even jokes anymore. Like uh, comedy police, like Elon Musk is poignant here because it's like, Oh, he took over Twitter and he removed all of the, uh, the uh, all of the uh, codes of conduct rules or whatever they call them about um, saying certain words. So people are just like, spouting hate speech constantly it's like comedy's back y'all and it's kind of like no what you're talking about there is the fact that what they're lamenting and saying nobody can say anything anymore these snowflakes have taken over (laughs) oh facts don't care about your feelings is not that they can't say what they could but it doesn't have the same libidinal sting that it did because nobody knows exactly where these prohibit pro prohibiting um pronouncements are coming from and right. like who's in charge of saying of we're, you know like Zizek always talks about like inherent transgressions implicit and explicit rules well the problem is that even th- there was a time where it's like you understood which rules you were supposed to disobey in order to be part of the the tribe in order to be part of a certain identity whereas now we don't know there's a displaced displacement like nobody knows what you can or can't violate necessarily in a certain context because without 
this ironic background without the possibility of some kind of subversion that because the subversion, the possibility of subversion is what keeps the symbolic substance alive, what keeps symbolic efficiency alive. But now we don't know what to subvert when, how to do it. And that's the real predicament that we're in that we're fine. I think we find so challenging. Um, And that that's, that's a digression, but, I just, I was, I really like uh, your example there of the reactionary guy in, in therapy for that reason. Um, that concept of inherent trans- transgression isn't really going to appear in Lacan for a while now. I really love what he has to say here about, uh, I had to read this a few times because I was really confused. It's like the pleasure proper to activity, pleasure in play. But he talks about, the harmonious natural mode of functioning of one getting to connect to the stages of development, free blossom blossoming of what in his organism reaches in its own time maturity. And I wonder if that's a stab at like Winnicott, you know, with like play in reality. You think so? Yeah. Or it's like, still he's on the lines of Merleau Ponty, especially like with pedagogy. Uh, I wonder how much of in dialogue he was with, Merle Ponty's work um, and how close they were. But the, the idea that there is this yeah, like, like notion of, he says, like, if what need would we have of our technique if we're trying to teach people basically how to play better, how to enjoy right. better? This, is, right. this does relate to what we're talking about. And it's like, and that's what the demand is of fix me. When yeah, one goes to baby. therapy, it's also teach me to enjoy better, teach me to play better, keep my right, strengthen yeah. my symptom. Yeah, because like and that's the thing. It's like this is this is why like even though he's flirting with philosophy, he's talking about Plato, he's talking about Kierkegaard, talks about Merle Ponty, and, uh, and like all these other different like theorists and scientists. Like he's not advocating that we need to teach them, you know, the law of thermodynamics. You know, you need to teach your patient about like how you know, the symptom relates to this thermodynamic law of entropy. Rather, it's a model for analysts to kind of understand better, but in the same thing, it's like all about understanding how the transference can be metaphorized in different ways to understand. Because the thing is, is that transference has a metaphorization to it when you're talking with, or when the patient is is expressing themselves to you. So different ways to understand. He's like pretty much invoking like this creativity in them to like how transference transference can operate while himself being Lacan evokes transference in people in his speech in his writings because he sounds confusing but at the same time it's like even though I think you're a madman there's something to you that I still want to pick out right that's the whole point of his form and I think it's beautifully written but yeah like what he's saying is like for analysts it's like you're not trying to teach them philosophy. You don't want to alienate them more from their symptom. Um, you want to give them the, con- the conditions and the grounds for that they could be able to work that out within themselves by free associating, right? And at the same time, maintain this enigmatic, uh, to still another word from uh, the homie Jason, desire for this knowledge that they believe that you have in yourself, in the, like that they believe that the animal has, right? The, the whole discourse of like, you know, there's this knowledge within you, this this agalma that, you know, is going to fix me, right? So I can fit this expectation. Because the analyst Zan believes that the analyst has the expectation for them, right? What is the desire of the analyst, right? Not just that the analyst needs to maintain, like, oh shit, what is my desire? But it's like the analyst Zan believes that there's this desire and expectation that the analyst animus fit and that's yeah um and again like he's not trying to suggest that we again have a pedagogy or a way of learning or a way to make one better for you know society but at the same time it's like to get you to really unlock the i guess the unconscious to make the un- the unconscious enunciate itself because there is always a subject of enunciation um, 
and it goes back to what I was saying about like the whole reactionary person, like imagine like a reactionary type of person, conservative, try to be an analysis, like even if they're like, you know, I'm all about free speech, yada, yada, yada. Like, I don't care what you do behind doors. Just don't put it in my life type thing. But then when they talk about like, you know, what they believe in or how they feel, it's just like, then they censor themselves. Like that's never talked about. And they're put in this vulnerable position where it leads to resistances, uh, I would imagine. So, but the resistance, not on the level of like uh, the real that resists civilization, but just the fact that they could resist in that they stay silent. Um, maybe they skip sessions, you know, the whole nine yards um, of just like having a hard time to really be like, what am I supposed to do? Because it's different in analysis because you're so confused about what you're supposed to do and what you are trying to fantasize and speculate of like what you should be for your analyst or how you think the analyst should be for you. Whereas like a CBT, DBT bro is already putting that expectation. They, they, they are looking at like, you know, some paperwork that you filled out at the, the, uh, the waiting room, like on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling today? Any thoughts of suicide? How often do you drink? Do you smoke or use tobacco? Um, you know, did you have thoughts of suicide? Uh, all that nine yards. And then they go from there. Like there's this paperwork that already determines how you're going to be before you enter the room. Which works with this idea of harmonious natural mode of functioning which is i am maladapted i am maladjusted and i need adjustment which is a very humanistic view of man actually okay only humanistic within the light of scientism right in a sense whereas the perfectibility of man was once more a notion that wasn't about getting back to, I think, any kind of or organicist ideal, which is only a myth of science, kind of Rousseauian myth of science, which is what allows scientism to, to, to be what it is, which gives it its um, founding myth in a strange sense. But it's like, this notion that things work and things don't and things that don't work should be made to work. And the analyst would be that person who would make me work the way I'm supposed to work because supposedly there's a function to being human. Doesn't Maybe that sound like logical time though. How so? With that this person has like my symbolic order of what it means to be man because I don't have it. <laughs> you say that again? That that this the, that the other person has my freedom in emancipation and what allows me to be in the symbolic order of what it means to be human. That man does not know what it means to be man, but in relation to other men, pretty much. That was the the one of the you know final statements in. Uh, the logical time essay and that's the same thing you know when we look at the analytic sessions like they have my this this knowledge that they have and in this relation to jouissance and enjoyment for my cure allows me to recognize that who I am within the social order because it's not the fact that I need to be cured and I need to you know be fixed and this person is going to fix me they have this knowledge but it's going to allow me to be back to normal yeah. Because everybody, even the most antisocial person, is always in a social network. There's no this like isolated thing where it's like, oh, you know, I hate people. Everybody says they hate people, but at the same time, they're still socializing. You can only say that you hate people within a social network, like right? in a in a in a social formation. And that even if you hate people and you don't socialize, you're still socializing on social media by you know posting memes, you know, that you hope people will like that are cynical about how much you hate people or like that you relate to Patrick Bateman or some shit like that. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> uh, what about Gribuil or Gribuil or how I'm going to learn French eventually, but we have the famous anecdote about the young boy who goes to the funeral <laughs> and says, many happy returns, gets himself yes. into a mess. This is the joke I was I was foreshadowing, by the way, for the death drive and learning. <laughs> and then he goes to, or he's told, no, you don't say that. At a funeral, you don't say many happy returns. You say, may God rest his soul. And then he goes to a wedding and he says, may God rest his soul. (laughs) Thinking, okay, that's the right thing to say. Here is learning. This is how learning. You want to know about learning? You want to learn? This is how learning takes place. There there is a funny joke that too, because it's like, you might as well be dying in marriage because it's like- Exactly. You you marry the person you love. No, it's the person that you hate the most. (laughs) I'm pretty sure this is is the joke, right? (laughs) He's drawing on a joke. (laughs) Look at freaking- uh, uh, it was a, a king of queens, like how much that they hate each other. Like, you know, the wife is just always like nagging and critical on him. Uh, like uh, they got mar- mar- married with married with children type. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, this is like a kind of like boomer sort of joke here. It, and he still gets in trouble. I think the whole point of this is that learning is in itself traumatic. I was thinking about in the first chapter of Benvenuto Cellini's autobiography. Benvenuto Cellini was the metallurgist who created the famous statue in Florence. Maybe you've seen it of Perseus holding the head of Medusa. Mm. You ever seen that famous? It's very striking, very beautiful. He wrote an autobiography that was just filled with embellishments and straight up confabulations about the amazing life he lived battles fought when he wasn't making amazing statues. And he talks about his father when he was young, suddenly boxing, boxing him on the ears out of nowhere. And he says, I'm sorry I had to do that son, but I wanted you to take a look at that lizard that appeared in the hearth there near the fireplace. So you would never forget it. And basically the idea of that is that the best way to get someone to remember anything is to hurt them. (laughs) Right. It's really fucked up to say, but it's sort of like learning can be fun. No learning is painful and traumatic and violent. And it involved the violence involves being, (sighs) taken into the circuit of the symbolic order. Right. That's and, what and, I get from here. But no, there's more to it than just what I said. That, I know there's more at, to it than that. If you look at corporal punishment and its function, like that's how it like originally suited. But like, isn't there something more like disciplinary with this? Like, and like in relation to like learning in that sense and in remembering than not just being beat, like how it was in school back in the days, but like in being put in a position of condemnation to be filled with guilt. And that's what, like, you know, in, in both the reactionary and, like, the whole libtard thing of, like, cancel culture, they're both cancelators, but of, of, of always trying to fight for recognition and trying to condemn one or the other. Like, this, there is a resentment to that, and the resentment breeds shame and guilt. To be put in that and to learn that and to always be in the position of being guilty or shameful, like, that is a part of, in a sense, learning in that sense that's more violent than just being hit. Bars. Yeah. yeah. And you know why that, and I, I wrote about this in, in my Dragon Ball essay. If any of you are listening, please, please follow me on Medium. In my link tree. Definitely the compulsion to repeat with his perviness. <laughs> <laughs> with that's lunch. an essay right there. <laughs> it's peachy, peachy girl. But uh, no. I wrote about this in in the essay, how the thing about the symbolic order is you're always interpolation is also an accusation. You're interpolated by this symbolic order. You're addressed by it. You're given your subjectivity, but your subjectivity 
or subject hood, let's say your status as subject is in um, inextricably tied up with your guilt, your debt. You are in debt. You're indebted to the symbolic order. You are always already guilty in a sense. There is something accusatory about the symbol in, in as much as it addresses you. Darian Leader talks about this and what is madness. I, I thought I really like this, the idea that uh, he talks about Tuesday's address in a kind of clinical context and interpolation, but how to hear your name, to hear someone say your name out of nowhere, d- don't you feel accused? Don't you feel like, am I in trouble? D- did right. I do something? You, you start in that moment. You're like, oh my God, did I do something wrong? Yeah, that's like the, the Navy sim- right there. That's like the Navy 101. <laughs> the symbol... Yeah, yeah, there you go. So that kind of interpolation, that sort of like disciplinary function carries with it in its its very function a kind of accusation. Its address is always something terrifying. No one wants to be addressed. People say they want to be recognized, but you don't want to be addressed because it's like, oh, now I have to do some shit. Right. I'm being called upon to do something, perform, to act. That's a terrifying position to be put in, but that's what language does. It calls upon you to supposedly not even act or do something necessarily, but it calls upon you. It says who you are and it imputes guilt. I think that's what is happening here. It's like with Grib, Grib wheel, Grib well, however you say it, <laughs> he's, uh, I remember the way, uh, the homie BB was talking about it. Like he said, uh, he's like, a, I didn't look it up. I should have, I'm a lazy motherfucker, but like the, it's a kid, obviously. He was like saying the, the wrong thing at the wrong time. It's like, that's what makes, you know, kids say the darndest things, right? That's what it's like. Um, damn, that's like the second Cosby reference I've made in a few episodes. That's not good. <laughs> Uh, he was very he was a cultural staple for a very long time y'all the, the, uh, the compulsion to, <laughs> to cosmify everything uh, he just doesn't know but he's punished for not knowing right. the, the thing is it'll make sense to him eventually but It'll make sense, not because it inherently makes sense to say many happy returns right. at um, a wedding versus may That's God rest his soul at a, a funeral. It, it has to make sense. It'll, you will force something into making sense in order to, I don't know, to survive or to maintain a certain symbolic place in the world. Exactly, because it has nothing to do with evolution. And it has nothing to do with like, you know, this evolution, like, and not like just like Darwinian evolution, but like the whole uh, Merleau Ponty of like, um, you know, perception and the primacy of it, of understanding. It's like some people will never understand. You will never understand the totality of things, right? And we need to, and I, and you mentioned, I mentioned Brian Becker, you just mentioned Brian Becker. We have to understand that Merleau Ponty doesn't necessarily hold on to this stance for the entirety of his work. Okay. In fact, he was actually on the same track as Lacan was in his later writing, but he died too young. But the visible and the invisible, that what is visible to us is something that we try to hold on to the like in, in symbolic language and understanding. But there is just some things that reach out into the what's called the invisible, which you could see as mainly probably the real as what uh, is called wild being, right? Or like the understanding of the flesh um, in which there is a gap in that, a gap between consciousness, perception, and wild being, or even like, you know, the whole understanding of the flesh, uh, which almost seems like a split between you know the ego and the unconscious or the, you know the subject of the unconscious or whatever especially since it's funny because in seminar 11 when he's talking when Lacan's talking about the gaze he is referencing visible and the invisible which is pretty cool like he's like on terms with Louis Ponty in, in that sense <laughs> uh 
I love though this sort of quadratic here of trauma fixation reproduction transference. transference. Yeah. Wait, that's the whole thing though about what the transference allows you to do is that the compulsion to repeat happens in different ways. And so it's like the whole point of the joke, right? You know, you're not supposed to say that, you know, you're supposed to say this. And it's not that the people that are telling this person to say this rather than say that is not the fact that the analyst is telling you to say something rather than what you said. It's the level of the discourse of the other, or even the super ego that is rather trying to tell you to say something rather than what is being said. And in the compulsion to repeat, it's like you may not know what you said or understood what you said in the session, but it's like you will soon, soon understand and you will create a sort of historicization of yourself. And it's not always pretty, right? It could definitely be ugly, but it's the point of the fact that you're always going into analysis to work through this sort of coming to terms of your identification or what you put together. Right. I love that. So learning is, I don't want to say achieve because it seems like you'd be learning something, but learning is processed through this series of identifications. Right. Right. Would so you like, say? You know, yeah. Like you, you question those identifications and it's like, well, like in the sense of like, if, if somebody like this, right, who says many happy returns at a funeral and then gets yelled at, and then it's, and it's supposed to say, may God rest his soul, and then says, like, may God rest his soul at a funeral, and, like, it's still getting the same thing. There, there is this sense, like, if they keep repeating this in different ways, it's like, there is this sort of identifying, always, you know, saying the wrong thing, or always being judged, or always being attacked, right? But the point is to understand why they feel that, or why they interpret it using that language, using that, those, those metaphors of feeling attacked or feeling like on the receiving end, you know, whatever the metaphor is, it's like to elaborate further and not to get to an understanding, but to get to actually naming, right? The desire, because it's, it's not necessarily the fact that they, you know, it's maybe not the fact that understanding is wrong on the level of the analyst and, but definitely it's not the fact that the analyst should understand the analyst and. But the analyzan needs to be able to continue to create an interpretation because maybe the interpretation for one session is not the same as another interpretation of the next. Because especially if we're dealing with an obsessional, they might be coming back thinking about what they said from the last session. Maybe that's wrong, yada, yada, yada. And then like, come up with me, why would you let me say that? Like, again, we don't know what... An obsessional is just so obsessional that they could fixate on so many things and also be like, why would you let me say something like that? And here comes the fact it's like, it's not a two with body psychology. The analyst is not on the level of understanding. It's about letting them give you the permission to not enjoy and be able to. Well, what about this though? The the way in which a signifier gets velcroed on to a signified is also what I got from. I mean, that's in a sense. And, and that would still be on the level of like, not just metaphorization of like, so the way I understand like the, the signifier velcroing onto the signified, it's like, there's not just a signifier, but a signifying chain, right? And it ultimately tries to lead to the formation of signifying the ego, but it still fails, right? Unless it's trying to signify the subject. The subject, I would say, yeah. Uh, right. The I, I feel like the ego in that sense is, damn, kind of a vanishing image on the horizon that, Hmm. 
Well, because the ego <laughs> still relies on identification, whether it's the ego ideal or the uh, ideal ego. Well, is it that? It, it, sorry to interrupt, but like, is it that? It's very difficult, even at this point, to situate the ego. Right. It's, well, yeah, I, the ego I'm right. having a lot of difficulty situating the ego, even after this deep into seminar two, after reading all of seminar one, and that I well, guess it's. Thing. If we're trying to have difficulty understanding the situation of the ego, and we still keep trying to find situations for it, we are Leclerc's. <laughs> We're Leclerc's. Yeah, we're idolatrizing the ego. We should be. I think you're right. Yeah, <laughs> you're right because it's it, it's only a series of identifications. It doesn't exist anywhere in particular. Exactly. But then he wants to focus on this concept of like the mechanization of consciousness as something else. Right, and the fact is that like with. Energy and mechanization, it's like it could take point in any form that it's like you can't localize the ego in any way. Like, you know, wait, wait, but okay, so he has this concept of the psychological ego, which has always been a kind of cornerstone of Western philosophy. He says, Does Plato have something like an ego in his dialogues? Maybe. Then you have consciousness, Descartes. Descartes invented consciousness in a sense. Yeah. But yeah and he doesn't talk yeah. about, yeah, but well, no, he does kind of talk about the ego. I was just reading this in Cartani. It's like you, there's a discovery of a kind of transcendent ego, which would again be that virtual point of convergence that's discovered in consciousness. But the two are traditionally seen as one and the same. If there is a distinction, it isn't, instrumental right in a sense so the ego is equated with consciousness is equated with the subject they're all kind of brought together only i think he likes descartes because descartes does momentarily uh cleave the ego away from consciousness right with the cogito you know because i think ultimately the yeah has to do with still like awareness knowledge and understanding right whereas the ego is on the level of the substance right or the cogito that i think is still on the level of substance and that substance is supposed to be made aware and understood of because like with consciousness and when we get into phenomenology con like the whole phenomenological dictum is consciousness is consciousness of something And so I think he's still on the grounds of, right. you know, even if he doesn't agree with phenomenology to a lot of the extent of understanding of what Merleau Ponty is talking about, but the whole dictum of consciousness is that it's conscious of something. And it seems like there is this whole idol idolatry of, of the somethingness that even hmm. gets put into the realm of consciousness, which is consciousness. <laughs> That's why later on he's going to be like, maybe, yeah, that's why he's, oh, that's why he said the thing about Leclerc. Like, maybe Leclerc will stop when Leclerc talks about, like, at his best, he's great. But when he talks about the subject, eh, you know, one of Lacan's famous backhanded compliments, which he never gives anyone a compliment without also sort of taking a stab at them. <laughs> but I highlighted this. It's like pretty much if you don't oh, yeah. get love from Lacan unless you get a diss from him. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He uh, feeds you with one hand and slaps you with the other one. Exactly. He's like, yo, try this fucking stew I made. <laughs> I like what he says here. The dimension discovered by analysis is the opposite of anything which progresses through adaptation, through approximation. Read Gestaltism. Right. Through being perfected. It is something which proceeds by leaps and jumps. It is always the strictly 
inadequate application of certain complete symbolic relations. And that implies several tonalities, emictions, for instance, of the imaginary in the symbolic or inversely. What I get here is this idea of almost something like the scene of the primal horde and the sacrifice of the father. I guess we wouldn't call it a sacrifice necessarily, but not so much that scene in itself, but the idea of a a scene, the necessity of the kind of limbing out of a specific scene in history. That might seem remote from what we're talking about here, but it's like the subject's history, the reconstruction of this primal scene is significant in as much as it's constantly repeated. The effect always precedes the cause in some way. The cause has to be reconstructed from observing the effect. Such is the same of this sort of primal scene. The transference is the repetition of a certain scene that manifests through demand directed at the figure of the analyst as that figure that takes the place of object A, the object cause of desire, that which just can't be gotten at, the figure who has access to the knowledge that I need to be whole. Mm -hmm. You could apply that also, and it's been done by Slavoj on a wider scale to history in general, this inadequate application of certain complete symbolic relations of like aborted symbolic uh actions right that in their aborted state constitute a kind of structure to society mm-hmm. itself when projected past a certain point it's as if everything could be related back to a certain moment in history and Schreiber, for example, condenses within him different moments, different epochs of history. You know, Deleuze and Guattari talk about this and anti-Oedipus, this idea of just this like repetition of different moments in history of even, I think I was reading in Karatani recently. It's like sort of the Uber mensch is not someone who's, a great success who is truly strong and vital and powerful in a way that the weak man isn't his strength consists in the adoption of the situation in which he is born of a kind of perfectly contingent formation, a series of failures. The symbolic order is ultimately a failure. It cannot justify its own existence holistically. What it spits out as a result, as a consequence, is the subject. The subject is only that detritus of the symbolic order in that sense. So learning, progress, the holism that goes into humanism is only that attempt to endlessly circle around that which went wrong. That didn't mean it was ever right. Exactly. Yeah, it was never. Yeah, it was never right. Humanism is like a byproduct of what ends up being wrong to begin with, or not a byproduct, but just the fact that what it arises off of, like this, like historically and theoretically, like to get rid of one, the church, and also superstition, ends up going into a form of error. What do you mean by that? Like, so obviously the, the humanism and, and and the philosophical aspect is to get away from superstition from like scholasticism, right? 
and historically also to get away from like the authority of the church but it still relies on this sort of compulsion to repeat like a teleology of like the good form right but it still fails because like you know the common thing is it's like oh the thing about like reason and rationality and humanism is like you know when it goes wrong it leads to the french revolution as if it's like you know a demise granted was the french revolution good or bad the historical aspect is like it is a condition of many other things but the fact it's like it is a form of error where we learn right but then revolutions are never really like sort of like a totalized sort of like oh we learn from this because it's like every other revolution in the eyes of americans are failed but the American Revolution is somehow this thing of totalized, you know, we learned and we conquered and, you know, we're just so perfect type thing. Like, no, revolutions never are never a totalization of perfection, but rather they're a conglomeration and, and overdetermination of an antagonism. And mm. after the war is over, it could, still carries on that trace of contradiction that needs to be resolved in the next system. It is the message returning to the right the sender in an inverted form. Because what something actually means, what you want to say, returns to you in the form of its excess, which you cannot account for. Exactly. That is history itself. <laughs> recoil, it's little- the recoil, absolute recoil. Yeah. <laughs> of his of history. Yeah. Or as Absol says, like history, but what about her story? <laughs> what about her story? <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. That's what we're getting at here, y'all. There needs to be more her story. <laughs> because behind every great man there is a girl boss. Right. <laughs> you know, Andrew, I often say that people I supervise. Be careful not to understand the patient. There's right. no sure way of getting lost. Patient yeah, that's says something which one cannot, can make neither head nor tail of in repeating. To right, me. right. Don't understand. Against understanding. I love what he says here too. It's like really funny. One fails to understand that this isn't an explanation or if it is one that means we aren't animals. We aren't musicians the way my little dog is going all dreamy when I put on certain records. <laughs> <laughs> His little dog goes all dreamy when he puts on certain <laughs> records. Like, what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, like, it's like, I, I imagine, like, my dad's dog doing that when he plays, like, his uh, his Pandora playlist because my dad doesn't know how to use Spotify like a boomerang is. <laughs> But like, you know, the dog like falls asleep and just like is listening to music. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like if you have if you if, if, if pet owners understand, like, you know, your pets do these weird things and you do your own habits. <laughs> oh, I misinterpreted dreamy. I thought Yeah, like, you know, the dog was getting like romantic. Like, maybe like they pass out like like whatever, like with you know, routine act that you do. It's like, oh, it's time for me to take a nap because they're going to do this. They're going to read it. They're going to listen to music. <laughs> my my dad's dog always passes out on the floor on his stomach when he's bust, like bumping like hardcore ska or punk. <laughs> <laughs> that puts him to sleep? Yeah, for some reason. <laughs> okay, last section here talking about the homie Kierkegaard love this like (laughs) literally the father of modern philosophy right many respects existentialism there wouldn't be a Lacan without Kierkegaard if you think about it because he introduced a kind of poetry into philosophy that was right sorely lacking if you think about it And, and irony and repetition right and error but not only that, like, what makes Kierkegaard great is, like, the fact he's, like, he's the, like, probably, besides Nietzsche, the, but, like, the first to say, I hate Hegel, 
and yet I'm doing dialectics. <laughs> Everybody hates Hegel, but in their own way. Nobody, yeah, it's, it's nobody like, hates Hegel in this. Yo, the, the, the way that, like, I'm just going to say the way that you're positioned right there in front of, like, your uh, curtain, and you got, like, that little cor- coral thing. It's like it's the Caesar. laurel wreath. Yeah, you got Caesar right there. <laughs> but, um, that's like, right, boy. That's how I was born in July. <laughs> and, but, like, it's like there is a transference to Hegel, apparently. <laughs> There's a strong, there's a marked transference onto Hegel for real. <laughs> but to, whether it's Kierkegaard not giving him his props or Schopenhauer straight up scheduling his lectures at the same time as Hegel. Right. Everybody be transferring onto Hegel. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like pretty much, obviously. Kant wasn't alive for Hegel, but Schopenhauer was a Kantian simp that is pretty much trying to defend in the light of Hegel. <laughs> I like Schopenhauer to a degree, but I do too. And at the same time, like I think he's a better Kantian than Kant, or at least it's a continuation. But Schopenhauer as well that we need to add in that he never is in dialogue. Schopenhauer was the uh, the Joe Budden of philosophy. <laughs> he really is. He really is the Joe Budden. Yeah. That's true. He's the Joe Budden. That's a good, yeah. Like, That's he's kind of, he's very engaging, but he's just bitching all the time. Yeah. He's a good writer. He's messy. definitely a good writer. Yeah. He's definitely sure. a good writer. But yeah, he is a Joe Budden. <laughs> that's, that's pretty that's good, a, right? Uh, that's a yeah. bad <laughs> um, All right, Kierkegaard, on the other hand, I love the distinction he makes here between, you know, uh, reminiscence and repetition. We have two different ways of learning with... Right. Or what knowledge is, right? Yeah, and that's pretty interesting because it's like with repetition, it's like you're repeating something, but like you have this appearance of going forward, but like reminiscence is always like going back to remember the past. So that's always, that's also pretty interesting too. Which, yeah, of course, it always comes down to Platonism. For for Plato, the whole apparatus of the mind, the psyche, these faculties are preformed to welcome the objects they accommodate in some sense. And we get back to their structure, like at least in the Mino, for example, we're, we're able to kind of bring to the surface that structure through uh reminiscence and investigation of reminiscence whereas like for character guard here the difference between the pagan world and the world of grace hinges on on sin which i think is a really interesting sort of um term that he brings in here where it, you wouldn't expect it mm-hmm. and he tries to recreate this very enjoyable vacation he had uh, in Berlin, and the attempt falls flat. Right. Because yeah. repetition never gets at what it wants to get at, but only achieves its satisfaction through not getting it. And then- exactly and so like he has to go back and retrace his steps and it's like and i'm not trying to reduce like pleasure and repetition to addiction but it's like when you look at like somebody like that's addicted to like i don't know like heroin or becomes alcoholic they're always and this is where like that's cool about like somebody like gabor mate but then again they fall short as we talked about like a couple episodes ago um and in time it's like well you know, it's not about the substance, it's about why the pain, right? In a sense, there's this, like, interdependency of, like, pleasure and pain, but 
it's rather not on either or, but rather funny well, either or regard. But the fact of the compulsion to repeat, right, which is on a level of something that is not on the imaginary to try to find uh, an identification with, because on the the ego level there's an identification with a certain sort of pleasure, whether it's like, oh, what it was like to be in Berlin or to try heroin for the first time or when I was sipping 40s on the corner with my homies when we were freaking throwing crabs, right? And then now I'm an alcoholic. You know, the, it, it's on, that is a level of identification, but what does it mean to constantly compulsively repeat? Which is something that the DSM-5 or CBT or like AA means not understand when it comes to addiction because somebody can get rid of alcohol or narcotics and then end up finding something else and then either going back to the original drug or something different and it, it still fails and it still doesn't give them what they want or they commit suicide because it's like they can't find ways to compulsively repeat or to recreate and I think this is what is interesting is that it's always this recourse back to memory whether it fails or not but it's just like the memory of something right does that make sense yeah, absolutely. But it's about how we would connect that to the symbolic. It's almost as if there was a primordial utterance that yes. we're trying to get back to. Right. In some sense. That and, yeah, and it's never like on the realm of pleasure or pain, but like this utterance of like, well, what is being uttered of? Is it of enjoyment? Is it a prohibition? Like, what is, and, and I think right here is like where we start to get into this understanding of like, not only is there like the symbolic order utterance, but also like what is permissible with the super ego, because I think this is where he starts to mention the super ego. He does, yeah. Um, but first I wanted to point out here how he says, sometimes for lack of images, some symbols don't, see the light of day in general it is rather the symbolic deficiency which is worrisome i think that's really interesting sometimes for lack of images some symbols don't see the light of day it's a very mysterious sort of statement but right i i believe that lacan does not just want to jettison the imaginary for the sake of giving a better comprehension to the meaning of the symbolic. I think that the imaginary is very much present in symbolization. Definitely. And I think that's one of the things that uh, the transference itself is imaginary. Mm. And when you uh, look at Lacan's concepts in a purely philosophical context, it feels like the imaginary can be done away with because it's merely phenomenology. But at the same time, what holds symbols together is the imaginary. But he says some symbols don't see the light of day. Right. And, and that's... Not what, what does that mean? So that's where the transference is not imaginary. Because then you get on the level of frustration and privation in object relations or, or relational sci uh, psychology. It's on the level of the real. And if we're talking about symbols, we're talking about the symbolic. But if they don't see the light of day, it's like, well, then they are on the level of not of, of resistance in the sense that there are symbols that resist symbolization. Objet a and the presence of the analyst represent aspect of the real that transfers into, or what, what makes the transference happen, the twisting of the knots, right? And so when we look at the death drive and the compulsion to repeat, it's always on the attempt to create a sort of scaffolding in an imaginary scene, but it always fails since the point of failure with the real comes in that which doesn't see the light of day right exactly it is the same thing as the uh two two shapes 
passing each other in the night, leaving the trail of of their their effect and needing to reconstruct the exact shape. This right. is what he talks about in seminar one from the what's left in the wake of its passage in some sense. And right, 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 right. I feel like the symbol which doesn't have an image to correspond to it uh is that which is sort of reconstructed, which is being played out in the the gestures, the bungled actions, the right. the slips of the analysand in the transference. Exactly. Right. Um and, and it's like and again to add like in perspective on it, because people have a hard time really understanding it because like the common discourse is like, oh if you have a slip of the tongue that means something about the unconscious. It's like no. You could just have a random slip of the tongue and it doesn't mean anything at all. They just happen. And that's just because we just have an unconscious, but it doesn't mean there's something pathological or there's something that the, you put into question. It's only when they continue to do, continuously are repetitive and you continuously forget and slip or things fall short is when it's like, well, why did that come first before what was actually meant to be said, right? Or if you knew this name so well, why why is it that you're always forgetting? Or it's like, why is it that you're always forgetting certain names and that it's always in referential of a certain topic, right? That's when it matters most. It's when a pattern the, emerges. Exactly. Yeah, a certain combination. It's never just the fact of an isolated slip of the tongue or isolated forgetfulness. That's what Freud has been trying to say within like the uh, psychopathology of everyday uh, everyday life, right? You know, then, like people get wrong. Yeah. People get wrong. They just like, oh, I had a slip of the tongue. Oh, Freudian slip. I must be thinking of something. It's like, no, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> but then we have. I like what he says about, you know, you have this image of the Babylonian wax seal, how we imagine memory to be, but then he contrasts that with the machine that remembers every question. The adding machine which is in a sense fed <laughs> right the original and message that so, gives it its or how he says that adding function. machine is a lot more like dangerous than the the atom bomb like i'm just like what? right the, <laughs> the adding machine itself remembers something right it's another kind of memory and this is Yet another one of his uh, uses of uh, the machine as, in some sense, a corollary to right. what, what man is in that there can be a subjective experience that doesn't involve the, the human, you know? Yeah, yeah. A message inside of a machine, he talks about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he talks about something that proceeds by opening and not opening. This is the pulsion, right? The yes. pulsation that is drive. Yeah. Right? You think of ones and zeros almost, uh, the kind of binary. And which he will get into like in the portaling later and like his whole thing about cybernetics. It's like, yeah, the ones and zeros fundamental oppositions of the symbolic order this idea of there being like an original message and then he talks about an octopus which i think is really funny like just for this paragraph <laughs> i became very interested in a certain octopus that, that's just a funny where where is jordan Peterson is in the lobsters he's in the octopi. he's into octopi yeah exactly he's talking i just love uh how he says i became very interested in a certain octopus um, which is a totally normal thing to say if someone says it in that specific way, not just like, dude, I like octopuses, octopi, but I became interested in a certain octopus. I think that's a red flag. 
let's skip the octopus because I still cannot totally reconcile it with the argument that we're pursuing here, but it's like he talks about telepathy here and the way that there can be this transference that occurs in parallel between two patients. I'm thinking that there's like a certain certain patterns that emerge. Well, like, I would say, like, as far as like, because I feel like it's a metaphor of like telepathy, but like in so far as like, there's like the sort of like parallel feeling of um of a trance in both hypnotism and in transference. And that, and it's funny because both have trance, right? Like, like feeling like you're in a daze, you're fascinated. And like that's the whole thing about like the mirror stage or like the whole thing of the eyes, you know, this fascinare, right? You're captivated by the other. And there's this captivation in there. And so that like, there is a sort of telepathy that occurs in the transference um, in this, in the fact that it's like you kind of like, maybe this is not the case, but you always try to have this sort of like empathy toward the the analyst as the patient's like. I feel like maybe when I said this, you see, like they start to like sort of try to anticipate what the analyst is thinking when they're trying to associate how they feel in a daydream or sexual fantasy or like think about the memory like you feel like maybe you're probably interpreting this like there's that sort of telepathy of trying to anticipate your or mind read sort of type thing you know because there that's where the obsessional and the neurosis is it's like when they speak about it, they also need to like account for the analyst listening it's like do you think maybe you're thinking like this it's like they want to know what's on the analyst's mind with this sort of like telepathy. I think he's metaphorizing that, not a literal telepathy, but like sort of trying to anticipate what the analyst is thinking or trying to interpret. Interesting. Yeah. That's at least my interpretation of it. But he says subjects simultaneously experience such a such a symptomatic act or discover such an such a memory though. Link supports rings in the same circle of discourse. Well, I was thinking more like there's a kind of circle of discourse that unites different patients in a kind of circuit of meaning, or I really don't understand what right, that like, well, means. I mean like if we're talking about like maybe like a group analysis like mm -hmm. yeah I think so especially like, when it comes to like like what I just said group analysis and I think some somebody like the Guattari was trying to like transcend the limits of that with this like transversality rather than transference of a group but um I think it also goes back to like is it like the the whole understanding of group fantasy this sort of like linkage that unites like more than just one person in like a session but also like in just any scenario so they're caught up in the symbolic order in in just such a way that uh the the you can see the the the, the pulsation of certain signifiers working itself out in parallel ways right yeah well, in the right. discourse of different patients right and um i was like like what, what was i like speculating about about like uh channel five andrew callahan like how like he doesn't have any opinion on who he's interviewing but, like these group subjects of like these q anons or like random people it's like they like sort of share like this sort of group fantasy or like they share the same signifier in the way that they speak like even if they're 
they address themselves as like a particular individual, like the subject of enunciation lets themselves be known in certain instances. And like, he never has like this, like judgment of uns right. Okay. Just okay. lets it, lets it emerge on its own. It's kind of like, uh, when I think about kind of ejaculatory expression of just uh, fake news when people were saying fake yeah. news. Right. <laughs> it, it didn't like you could, like conservatives, alt right people were saying that even when the news wasn't even the topic, it was just like so, something that you didn't agree with was fake news. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just the way that uh, becomes a many happy returns kind of right uh, enunciation that becomes applied to something that has nothing to do with the news. Yeah. It just signals a kind of so, you know, I think about like I work in an office, it's like uh, with office culture, it's sort of you want what you say when you're not trying to ingratiate yourself. What you're trying to do is supposedly convey information in a way where all of uh, the the packaging of it is dissembled what i mean by that is that you know there is a packaging there's always a frame for any kind of speech act but uh, you want to dissemble that and that like all i'm conveying to you in this functional sense is information and in order to uh, keep up the appearance of information just merely being information there needs to be a kind of appearance that appearance itself needs some cosmetic attention in a strange way yeah no 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 i don't i don't know where that came from but like yeah that, that's the tendril of <laughs> Our, our our little discourse here, but just to wrap things up because we're already we're we're losing steam, and yet no. Lacan never lets you off the hook, not even no, near no. the end. Love this. I might just read this whole paragraph in its yeah. entirety. One because I love it. Two because I'm tired of thinking. Uh, <laughs> here we rediscover. Imagine I'm coming up with this. Imagine me and Andrew are saying this at in the moment if you think that like our powers are flagging lacan's able to sustain a discourse of this kind for however long it takes to say all of this <laughs> within the span of however many pages 10 pages like what the fuck right. that's yeah. pretty incredible but here we rediscover what i've already pointed out to you namely that the unconscious is the discourse of the other this discourse of the other is not the discourse of the abstract other, of the other in the dyad, of my correspondent, nor even of my slave. It is the discourse of the circuit in which I am integrated. Yeah. This is why he wants to say don't use it as mouthwash, because yeah. to use it as mouthwash would mean to, in some ways, use it as the the, the mouthwash of the gestalt, I feel like you're using. It's yeah. like the other is this big this other that you've outsourced to some transcendent plane of another, it's like, no, 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 no. It's not an abstract other. It's not the other of the dyad. That is nothing new or revolutionary. The idea that something else bigger than me speaks through me, then I am merely the vehicle of some greater cause. And no, I it's the discourse of the circuit yes, and in I which I am integrated. Like is also opposed to phenomenology to an extent with understanding like the, the other in the way that phenomenologist does because it's always in this immediacy of like my relation to you but it's like oh it's never you it's like the face of the other and like Levinas or like I don't know the perceptual other to Merleau Ponty or like the other that like recognize me as like a being that's a peeping Tom in Sartre like you know it's always on this phenomenological imaginary level, but Lacan is talking about an integrative circuit, which is totally different. It's like being in the system that allows me to posit an other, but I can only do so so far as I'm situated in this integral system 
and to which relays a circuitry of information and energy that everybody is a part of, but yet nobody knows who the other is, but they posit that in relation to this circuit, right? This is what I think where we get into the set theory and, and how like there is no meta language. You could only posit something like that within the system. But I think it's also the discourse of the circuit. Well, yes. you have the discourse that functions automatically, which expresses itself automatically, but you also have what he talks about some lectures earlier, the machine trying to take itself into account in some sense. And the subject is the attempt of the machine to take itself into account. So the other, it, the otherness is produced by that, the impossibility of the self-registration of the circuit taking itself into account as a whole. And this is why there is no big other. There's not a big other because all meaning is relative and there's no ultimate consensus on what things mean. That's a banal point. The point is that there's no big other because there, the symbolic order cannot totalize itself and the impossibility of its self totalization is what ultimately generates the subject that is the x that is the mark that it the or what zizek in uh for they know not what they do calls the remark yeah. of the subject as that which cannot be integrated in ultimately integrated into the circuit because the circuit cannot account for itself oh, yeah. absolutely that's what we call in some ways the superego, the excess of that yes. generates the superego. Just to continue, I just love what he says here. I am one of its links. It is the discourse of my father, for instance, insofar as my father made mistakes, which I am absolutely condemned to reproduce. Right. Yes. That's what we call the superego, sins of the father. Yes. I don't think it's a coincidence that he says this here and mentioned sin earlier. Yeah, earlier, the like Kierkegaard. I am condemned to I am con, con, de, condemned the, to reproduce them because I am obliged to pick up again the discourse he bequeathed to me, not simply because I am his son, but because one can't stop the chain of discourse. And it is precisely my duty to transmit it in its, I love this word, aberrant form, right. someone else. I have to put to someone else the problem of a situation of life or death in which the chances are that it is just as likely that he will falter in such a way that this, this discourse produces a small circuit in which an entire family, an entire coterie, an entire camp, an entire nation, or half the world will be caught. Boom. Right. Fucking yeah. Mars right there. And that's right there. Like you can see the whole thing about the four discourses being put into that because there's a sort of social link or bond within those discourses. And like I think he's preluding to that by calling it circuit, but then it'll become discourse. So like again, we have this sort of like embryonic condition for like the later Lacan. Like it's all in these first two seminars and they just becomes even more bigger and broader than the rest. Definitely. Yeah. But I just love this idea that like it's just I love that like the way he just expresses the entire family and nation. <laughs> Someone else's by extent like again there's so much of DNG in here too. Right. No, because it's really just like I couldn't it. help really but think did. about that, like transmitted in its aberrant form of just a kind of half heard message and a aberrant message that's like inevitably misinterpreted, which leads to these successive formations, these nested formations that are the individual, the family. And then I think of the atom bomb, even like this, this like absolute destruction of everything because of a transfer, transferential moment, a message that's misinterpreted, that's not received. 
correctly this kind of we were talking about whisper down the lane idea of the symbolic order is all that is and at the same time it falters it is a mistake it is only it only exists by virtue of that which it cannot compute which is its totality russell's paradox set theory yeah that and this is the brilliant uh hegelian insight that lacan is can 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 claim is the idea that it's not just that things go wrong things malfunction that malfunctioning is what defines the machine not what it produces exactly. not what it facilitates mm-hmm. and then i love what he says here, how does Freud project that in the most literal manner onto the level, onto a level which ostensibly belongs to the order of biology? We'll have to come back to that the next few times. Life is only caught up in the symbolic piecemeal. Right. He composed. The human being himself is in part outside life. He partakes of the death instinct. Only from there can he engage in the register of life bars beautiful the symbolic piecemeal the crystallization of these identifications has to take the form of a symbol and the right. symbol itself is always something very much uh tetsuo like right here a sense it's always something that think of tetsuo as just like this weird blob of different yes sundry parts that's like what the fuck kind of like how what am i what's going on like that's the symbol it's not some complete thing we identify with it but because he doesn't know who akira is right yeah Yeah. And, and it's only like after like i guess like when he finally blows up and like kaneda is like fighting him and they have this like going back to the past and realizing they're in this orphanage and they realized who Akira was like after the damage is already done type thing. <laughs> but I was thinking more so in terms of just like. But in the level of identification, yeah. Or, or just the image of, you know, it's not so much like that which exceed. What's interesting about the real isn't so much how, to me, how it's like, oh, it's outside the symbolic order and then the symbolic order is just chugging along and it's like, oh, you're a misfit. I can't represent you. You're, um, you know, excommunicated out to the... It's more like where you get these like monstrous right. forms within the symbolic order. That's why I was thinking of Tetsuo. It's just like this kind of... What can't be symbolized though does receive a kind of symbolization in a sense but it receives and all signifiers are like this and it's like they the symbolization that uh, they affect is one of just like complete of complete monstrosity yeah every signifier is a kind of monstrosity it's a it's a butchering it's a deformation of not what it represents but like it creates what it represents it murders what it represents and it it can never be what it wants to be right that done. Was good. Done. <laughs>